welcome. Uh, before I change this slide, uh, we're going to have a couple of audience response questions along the way. And so these are the instructions. They're pretty simple. And uh, there were handouts, I believe, when you came in uh, that have the instructions. Oh, there weren't. Okay, there weren't any handouts. <laughs> but uh, it's pretty straightforward to do, and we'll uh, remind you of the instructions at the time. Um, I'm Marshall Rungi. I'm the Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs and Dean of the Medical School. And it's a tremendous pleasure uh, for us to be hosting the uh, Rosenthal uh, Symposium today uh, with the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, it's... Uh, this is an annual discussion uh, that brings attention to the most critical health care issues that we're facing. And I can think of no issue more critical than that of opiates. And we have a terrific uh, speaker. I'm not going to give speaker introductions, uh, but a terrific speaker and panelists. And I think it's, you'll find it a very intriguing and uh, motivating session this afternoon. I'd like to uh, extend a special thanks to the National Academy of Medicine, Dr. Zhao, uh, for the opportunity to have this. It's, it's a great opportunity for the University of Michigan, and I think made even more special by the fact that this is our 200th anniversary, our bicentennial year, uh, and it's quite a unique opportunity. This topic um, is one I know you're all familiar with. It's one in which there's been a huge acceleration of interest in the last year and a half or two years, uh, but we're far from having it solved. And I think we'll hear real experts in the field talk about where we ought to go in terms of solving this problem, which is crippling for the state of Michigan, but crippling for the United States. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Victor Zhao. I'll be brief only because I could be very long uh, and because uh, I don't want to get us off track. But uh, for those of you who don't know Dr. Zhao, he's the president of the Institute of Medicine. Uh, excuse me. I keep saying that. The National Academy of Medicine <clears throat> and is really a world renowned uh, physician, scientist, administrator who's held leading posts in leading academic institutions. He's made major contributions uh, to our understanding of hypertension and heart disease. On top of all that, a very innovative person who's brought innovation to uh, the care of these patients and to a number of different areas uh, and has been president of the uh, National Academy of Medicine uh, now for somewhat over three years. And as those of you who follow this know, has made really important major changes. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Zhao here today. Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, good. Thank you. Well, welcome to the 2017 Richard and Hinda Rosenthal Symposium. Uh, I want to thank, begin by thanking President Mark Tisso and Dean Marshall Rungi, University of Michigan, for hosting this event and allowing us to come celebrate with you for your 20, 200 years. That's pretty long. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Rosenthal Symposium. This endowed lecture series or symposium is sponsored by the Rosenthal Family Foundation and it's been an annual event of the National Academy of Medicine, used to be known as you know as the Institute of Medicine since 19, 1988. And each year, a key health and medicine issue facing our country is addressed through the Rosenthal Symposium. And over the years, we've welcomed many leaders in healthcare policy, academia, to discuss wide ranging issues from universal affordable healthcare to antimicrobial resistance to healthcare quality and many others. Two years ago, we celebrated 15 years of the seminal report from the IOM to Air's Human. And that, in fact, was a theme of Rosal Symposium. So last year, first time in history of uh, NAM or IOM, we took the Rosal Symposium outside Washington because we feel that we should be much better connected with our members, with the community outside DC. And our first uh, meeting last year was at Seattle in the other Washington University, or University of Washington, Seattle. And uh, so this year, we certainly feel that, you know, we'd love to come and celebrate with you your 200th University of Michigan. Before I talk about today's symposium, just for those who are not familiar with National Academy of Medicine, we are one of the three national academies which was originally founded in 1863 under the charter of National Academy of Science by President Abraham Lincoln and U.S. Congress. 
We were founded to be an independent organization to advise the U.S. government and U.S. nation on science and related areas. Over the last 150 years, we now have three separate academies, National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering, and National Academy of Medicine. And our members are really the most distinguished leaders, and there are many in the University of Michigan, and they have shaped the agenda in health and medicine. And today's topic, in fact, is the result of a great group of uh, organizing committee led by Marshall, but with Gil Oman, uh, with uh, Huda Akil, and, uh, and Martin Filbert, in choosing this topic of pain and opioid epidemic, a path forward. Now, you're going to hear a lot about this, so I won't want to go over all the statistics, except to say that over 2 million Americans uh, aged 12 and older had a prescription opioid use disorder. 600,000 have a heroin use disorder. And the amount of aggregate cost of prescription and opioid overdose addiction estimated to be over $78.5 billion in U.S. It's a big problem. Of course, drug overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death in the United States, and nearly two-thirds of all recent deaths attributed to opioid misuse. So if you think about this, drug overdose takes the life of 142 Americans every day, which, as described by the U.S. President's Commission report, is a death equal, toll equal to 9-11 every three weeks. It's an astounding number, and something obviously needs to be done. At the National Academies, we've been very interested in this topic, and we launched a number of initiatives to address this important topic. First, in July, we released a report, a comprehensive consent study called Pain Management and Opioid Epidemic. It was commissioned by the FDA. Among many of the things we said that should be done, one of the things I think is really important is to ask FDA to incorporate public health considerations into its approval and monitoring framework for opioids. As you know, drugs are now looked at in terms of risk and benefit for an individual. Here we're asking the decision made beyond individual, but look at the implication of public health, the neighbors, the family, and all the other diseases that come, in fact, with opioid addiction. Uh, we also, in September, released a special publication requested by the National Governors Association that calls on clinicians to, in fact, take responsibility and take action in leadership roles in turning the tide. And just six weeks ago, at the National Academy Annual Meeting, uh, one that's organized by Gil Oman, at the President's Forum, we had uh, former Secretary HHS Sibelius, the Surgeon General Jerome Adams, FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb, Governor of Massachusetts Charlie Baker, and the Federal Judge Steve Lightman to talk about how complex this issue is and how many different components are there to this puzzle. And so we are very, very committed to addressing the issue at the National Academy of Medicine, convening, therefore, many different groups to address this particularly challenging issue. And of course, today, this is a critical issue in today's symposium in looking at uh, uh, this particular aspect of management of acute and chronic pain, and of course, the issue of opioid. And I won't go over the program per se, except to say we're just so thrilled uh, having uh, the great panelists and speaker here today. This last one word is I'd like to thank the organizing committee, as I already have done, in terms of Hilda, Gil, Oman, Martin Philbert, and Marshall Rungi, but also the UM staff and the NAM staff, uh, Quinda Vridi, Kim Belogia, uh, Meg McCoy, Morgan Kenrek, and Sir Hasek. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll now uh, call on our, our president, uh, Dr. Mark Schlissel, who will uh, give remarks and make an introduction. So 
So thanks, Marshall, for the introduction. And thanks, all of you, for coming here today uh, for your uh, work and your contributions to research in, in this important area and in all the other things the university works on. Uh, we're honored that the National Academy of Medicine has brought the prestigious uh, Richard and Hinda Rosenthal Symposium to our campus to advance understanding of such an important societal and national health care uh, problem. Uh, as the nation's first university to own and operate a hospital, the University of Michigan is proud to lend our considerable expertise to the issue, one which affects so many people in our society. Earlier this year, we launched a new initiative that taps into our tremendous potential for addressing major societal health problems like the opioid crisis. It's called Precision Health at the University of Michigan. This initiative will deploy the power of big data to examine the interaction of genes, the environment, and behavior so that physicians can better diagnose and treat illness and promote good health, one individual patient at a time. For our first new project through the initiative, we chose to tackle our nation's opioid crisis. The project will examine ways we can predict how much pain medication post-op patients will need based on their individual genetic profile, physiological condition, social, environmental, and lifestyle factors. This research also has the potential to identify genes that predispose individuals to addiction, allowing us to focus intervention on those most at risk. I believe there's no better university in our nation to tashle, tackle a problem like this. We have faculty excellence across all the related disciplines in our schools and colleges and institutes that are already leading the way in discovery and education related to society's biggest problems. For instance, our Michigan Genomics Initiative reached a huge milestone this October with its 50,000th participant enrolled. This makes it one of the largest opt-in consented databases in our nation. The database has already led to many exciting discoveries by scientists working in various disease areas, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, macular degeneration, and now opioids. University of Michigan researchers have also developed a new tool to help surgical teams gauge the, number, the amount of medication for post-op pain management following 11 common operations. This evidence-based guide is available online for free. It draws on pain control and surgical quality research, as well as data and surveys from patients who had operations at 72 hospitals throughout the state of Michigan. Precision Health at the University of Michigan is just beginning. I encourage faculty researchers across our campus to learn how you can get involved, access resources, and collaborate on our efforts through one of the town halls we're planning this evening as well as next week. A full schedule is available on our Precision Health website. I'm now honored to introduce our featured speaker. Alan Bassbaum is professor and chair of the Department of Anatomy at the University of California, San Francisco. He's considered to be the world's expert in pain. His research addresses the molecular mechanisms that underlie the generation of persistent pain after tissue or nerve injury. Throughout his distinguished career, Dr. Bassbaum has examined the many factors that contribute to pain and pain control, using approaches grounded in anatomy, behavior, and genetics. He's worked to delineate the circuitry and molecular mechanisms that underlie pain. To help students and the public understand how we experience pain depends on an individual's biology, psychology, and culture. He likens pain to how we perceive beauty. In an article on, on Wired.com titled, Why Does Stubbing Your Toe Hurt So Damn Much? He said, there's nothing inherently beautiful in something. And what's beautiful in this culture isn't necessarily beautiful in another, even if it's the same object. Pain is the same way. At the end of his keynote, Dr. Bassbaum will be joined on stage by Huda Akil, Professor of Neuroscience and Psychiatry and co-director of our Molecular Behavioral Neuroscience Institute. Dr. Akil will moderate a brief question and answer period with the audience. Until then, help me welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Alan Bassbaum. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Dr. Schlissel, Schlissel for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I want you to know I'm wearing a blue and gold tie. It happens to be the same colors as the University of California, which makes it a little easier, because I only, I only own one tie. 
Um, I thought it would be helpful. Um, do I switch over to? There I go. Yeah, this is just a, a, a slide. I was editor in chief of Paint for many years. It's a miserable job, as everyone knows. The only thing good about it is you got to pick the covers. Uh, and so this illustrates the breadth of the pain experience, and I won't go through them. I may touch on a few of these as we go through, through the talk. Um, this is the title of my talk. I initially thought I was uh, going to talk about si the science ongoing in my lab, and then it became very clear, no, the, the, the real mission here is to talk about the future of pain management. Where, where are we going? Uh, and I'm going to do my best to, to do that. I thought it would be useful to, to just tell you a little bit about I did a little bit of reading uh, as, as to who is Richard Rosenthal. Uh, and he was an entrepreneur uh, and very successful during World War II, made a lot of money. And what was very special, and I think the quote that I've found, uh, those of us who have been fortunate in society should make a real effort to put something back. I don't mean just money, but energy and thought, the whole panoply of one's intellectual capacity and experience. That's a nice way of recognizing the importance of science, research, the arts, which he also supported. It was really an impressive guy, so I'm quite honored to be here, and I really appreciate the invitation, Huda especially, who invited me and anyone else who was involved, so thank you. Um, why are we here? Well, we heard a little bit about this. This illustrates the problem so vividly. Um, this is the number of overdose deaths uh, since 1999. One million overdose deaths since 1999. You can see the slope is shifting uh, horrifically. Uh, 50,000 people dying every year. Uh, and something needs to be done. And I think the, the country is finally waking up to the problem, even though it's been around for a while. I, I should point this out. This is an interesting story. I, in 1989, Jean-Marie Besson, who died not too, too long ago, a French uh, pain specialist, and I organized a conference in, the, in Berlin. Now, you may know 1989. It turned out the, the meeting started literally the day the wall came down. Um, there'll never be another meeting like that. Um, and the idea was we organized, it was a Dahlem conference, and the idea was to generate a book, and we had the title and most of the articles written ahead of time it was called Towards a New Pharmacotherapy of Pain Beyond Morphine. After one week of discussion, by the time the meeting was over, and we'd go to the wall every time, and we'd chop, I looked a little younger there, we'd chop some pieces out of the wall, we changed the title of the book, we dropped the word Beyond Morphine. Uh, it was very sad. We realized at that time the opiate receptor had just been cloned, and this was it. We are going to solve the problem. No problem at all. Well, it turned out not to be the problem. Uh, and so 30 years later, and it's still the drug of choice for severe pain. There really is nothing better, uh, certainly for post-op pain, for cancer pain. But there's obviously many problems associated with the opioid use. So on the one hand, it's, there's good news, but there's a lot of bad news. So I'm putting this in the context of crystal balls. Uh, I was asked to predict the future. Well, I'll do my best. Uh, what does the crystal ball say about the future of pain medicine? So let's talk a little bit about pain for those who aren't familiar with it. So people in the pain field, my wife, who's not a scientist, um, doesn't understand why I keep using this slide. I, brought, I said, I'll bring it up to date. There, so Descartes, <laughs> Descartes actually wrote about pain, believe it or not, in the 17th century. And what he said is that the fire burns the foot, and then there's a wire that rings a bell, and you get pain. It's a straight through telephone line. That's how pain is generated. Very simple. The sad part is that it's not that different from what we actually teach. Not we. I, I won't speak for myself because I go in a little more detail. What most medical students, nursing students, PT, you name it, are taught. Namely, what they're taught with a little bit more contemporary neuroanatomy is that you have a noxious or painful stimulus, an injury stimulus that activates a nociceptor, the sensing uh, sensory fiber. It's homogeneous, at least that's what the, lecture, the books say. Goes into the spinal cord, up to the brain, and poof, you get pain. It looks very much like the Cartesian view of pain. Of course, you cut the wire and the pain should go away. I actually tell this to the medical students. I say it's like a telephone, right? You know, when you cut the wire and then and then they look at you and they don't know what you're talking about because that's... <laughs> Never mind. Uh, but you know what I mean. 
So it is more complicated. So let's have a little, just a brief review, and I apologize if this is simplistic for some who are familiar with it, but I'll, I'll go through a little bit of background. So here's an individual who is now burning, uh, he has a peripheral nerve. The peripheral nerve contains a variety of afferents. This could be the uh, a nerve in the arm, a nerve in the leg. And the ones we're most interested in are the small myelinated, they conduct slowly, and the unmyelinated nociceptors that conduct very slowly. These are the so-called pain fibers. There's no real pain fibers, but they respond to the injury stimulus, because pain's in the brain. When there's a burn, you activate these unmyelinated nociceptors, and you do get pain. So, Let's start with the nociceptor. So here's a nociceptor. It innervates the skin. It's got a peripheral terminal, a cell body in, in the sensory nerve, the ganglion. And then it connects up with spinal cord and then it goes off to the brain. When you have an injury stimulus, you get action potentials coming centrally and you get pain. Very simple, just like the textbooks say. Now, what's interesting, of course, is we know that there's heterogeneity to the pain fiber now. And that's what the molecular biology revolution taught us. And everyone's been to a dentist and knows that if you get a local anesthetic, the pain goes away. It's very effective because you're blocking voltage-gated sodium channels, uh, and they're extremely effective. The pain goes away. It's very effective, and so, in my mind, a lot of targeting of the periphery is important. Now, what's interesting is that there are subtypes of sodium voltage-gated sodium channels, at least nine, maybe even ten. And the question is, are there ones that are much more relevant to pain? And this is where a real breakthrough recently, not that long ago, um, a family was discovered in, originally in Pakistan that has a mutation of the NAV 1.7 subtype of the voltage-gated sodium channel. These individuals have absolutely no pain. It's a beautiful article published in the New York Times Magazine of this woman who is completely pain-free. It's a horrible condition, obviously, because pain serves a useful purpose. It's a warning signal. It's chronic pain that's the problem. But this woman, this, this girl, has absolutely no pain at all. The question, of course, from the pharma industry is, well, maybe it's a target that you could target. Uh, and so when we look at the crystal ball, one of the questions, <laughs> you're going to hear a lot of this, so get used to it. Uh, can pharma, and they're the ones who are going after it, selectively target NEV 1.7? We have local anesthetics that will target them all. That's no good. They get into the heart. They get into the brain. You have seizures. You want the beauty of 1.7 is only expressed by the sensory neurons, which means that if you could target it, you could have a terrific uh, pain reliever with minimal, hopefully, side effects. Well, what's the data? Can it be blocked? Well, there is a trial that was recently completed, and it's sort of mixed results, but somewhat encouraging, somewhat discouraging in trigeminal neuralgia, which is considered one of the worst pains you could ever have. Uh, in NEV 1.7, this is uh, Joanna Jakzuska, who uh, led this trial. Uh, and suffice it to say, pharma is going after it full-blown to try to develop a selective antagonist, because there's every good reason to believe that it would be uh, a terrific drug. Um, there's also the opposite. There are patients who have a condition called erythromyalgia, where there's an overactive NEV 1.7. This is a miserable pain condition. You can see that the people come in with red feet, red hands, burning hands and feet. They usually have wrapped in cold. What Steve Waxman, one of the mavens in this field, recently published a paper that suggested that there might be a precision medicine for pain. And in this case, what he showed is that a an anesthetic, a, uh, not an anesthetic, an anticonvulsant that is used in, in seizures, also the drug used in trigeminal neuralgia, but also happens to be a sodium channel blocker, namely car carbamazepine, or Tegretol is its name, turns out that it specifically blocks one of the mutations of NAV 1.7, and it binds it and maybe regulates it. And so the idea, it's one drug, whether or not every other drug would work on different ones, nobody knows yet, but it's the notion that precision medicine, that there might be a molecular basis for different types of pain that could actually be targeted. Remains to be seen, but that's one direction. And of course, in the days we just heard about precision medicine here, there's precision medicine everywhere, and there's reason to believe that hopefully the pain world might see this. But the nociceptor is not just a bunch of sodium channels. There are TRIP channels. TRIP V1, my colleague David Julius cloned it. It's the channel that is targeted by heat 
painful heat as well as capsaicin, the algogenic pain-producing substance in hot peppers. Selectively binds trp one Pretty interesting. Other subsets express acid-sensing ion channels. Why is that interesting? Well, when pH drops in the setting of inflammation, the nociceptor starts to respond to things it shouldn't respond to. As an aside, when a patient comes in, their major problem, they'll tell you I have pain all the time. In fact, most of the time, they don't actually have pain. They have pain when they move. They have pain when they, when they put on clothes. It hurts, innocuous stimuli hurt. That's the major pain problem. Changing the threshold of this nociceptor because of channels like this are potential targets. The Holy Grail, one of the Holy Grails in my mind, is the mechanical nociceptor. I had a wonderful discussion earlier about looking at mechanical, noci mechanical uh, sensors in C. elegans. Um, patient major problem is it hurts when I move. Post-op, you can give them morphine and still often hurts when I move. Uh, and you've got to overcome that problem. That's a stimulus normally shouldn't produce pain, but it does produce pain because new channels are coming into play. Those are potential targets instead of trying to overwhelm it with a narcotic. And then the last one, and I'll come back to this later, is the cold sensor called another TRIP channel called TRIP M8. Interestingly, each of these channels, or many of them, also respond to uh, natural products Capsaicin obviously hits trip B1. Menthol, everyone knows menthol's cooling. Well, it acts through trip M8. And it doesn't appear controversial, but in my mind, that's the major cold sensor. All possible targets. Well, can you actually take advantage of these targets? Well, one of the approaches is let's just kill all the trip B1 cells. And that can be done using an, a, a, a capsaicin analog called resinifratoxin. It comes from a plant. Plants don't like squirrels, and so they make this stuff, and the squirrels, by the way, if you get a bird feeder and your squirrels eat, you just put a little pepper flakes in your bird food, you'll never see a squirrel again. Uh, the birds have the channel, but it's not active. So they, they bite into the capsaicin and it doesn't hurt, the squirrel will stay away forever. But you can kill all those nociceptors, the trippy one, with resinifratoxin. And Mike Iadarola recently published a paper um, very limited study where they injected resinifratoxin spinally to kill all of the nociceptors that innervate the spinal cord. And they looked at dogs that have uh, bone uh, mets. And they can't, didn't measure pain, but what they actually measured the point until they, they had to go to a standard treatment. The dog clearly was unhappy. And those in which all of those nociceptors were destroyed, they lasted a lot longer before they had to go to narcotics. So again, it's a different approach to treating a problem by taking advantage of an understanding of the biology of, if you will, the pain transmission system. What about trip channel targets themselves, trip V1 antagonists themselves? Uh, what does the crystal ball say? And I wish I could be more positive. Maybe. It's kind of the best. It's been disappointing, really disappointing. There are good trip channel antagonists, but they have side effects, and we'll come back to that later. Side effects are the bane of the analgesic world, is coming up with drugs that won't have side effects. That's morphine's problem. I will just suggest one that I see on the horizon. Now, chemotherapy-induced neuropathies, everyone knows someone who's, who has cancer and is getting chemotherapy drugs, and it affects your peripheral nerves, and many of these individuals have horrific chronic pains, neuropathic pains produced by nerve damage. And one of the worst pains they have is cold hypersensitivity. Horrible cold hypersensitivity. And the animal data is very suggestive that if you take trip channel, trip M8 antagonists, or you make a mouse in which you've knocked out trip M8, these animals lose all cold hypersensitivity. It is conceivable, and this is a potential. The drugs are available. I'm sure there are trials ongoing. It would be a major breakthrough to try to treat this uh, real serious problem, because what happens is patients say, I can't deal with the pain. I don't even want the chemotherapy anymore. It's that bad. Let's look more at the heterogeneity of the nociceptor. 
This is, I want you to, there'll be a test on this later. Um, this is my colleague, Rohini Kuhner in uh, Germany, who published this paper to give you a little bit of uh, a, a, a view of the biochemistry of the nociceptor. Another way to say there are a lot more targets to be investigated. Do any of them, are any of them going to be useful targets clinically to select? That's the goal. Do you want to block pain? You don't want to eliminate it completely, and you don't want side effects. Well, the world is going after many of these, and I suppose time will tell whether any of them are going to turn out to be useful. Okay, that's mostly acute pain. Let's switch now a little bit to chronic pain. So here's an individual with an arthritic condition, serious inflammation, joint destruction. Ask this person, do you have pain? Oh, yeah, I have terrible pain. And they say, no, do you have pain right now? Well, no, no, I, I don't actually have pain right now. Now, but when I tie my shoelaces, I have terrible pain. This is what I mean with the term we use is allodynia. That's what makes these life, the life of this individual miserable. Now, they can try NSAIDs, but many of them will end up on, on opioids in order to, to try to deal with, with the, the pain. So what causes this? We go back to our individual, and they have a burn. You have tissue injury. The tissue injury and leads to, I'm not going to go into the details, breakdown of lipids and the generation of arachidonic acid, which is acted upon by the famous cyclooxygenase or COX enzyme. You've heard of COX-1, COX-2 enzymes. This leads to the synthesis of prostaglandins, which in turn actually bind right on the nociceptor and lower its threshold. What a great way to produce hypersensitivity. And that's, in fact, exactly what you get. The pain threshold drops, and this patient is now hypersensitive, and innocuous stimuli now hurt. Take a warm bath that shouldn't hurt, now hurts. Move your fingers, it now hurts. Pinch a little bit, it now hurts. It's terrible. That's the clinical problem. How do you treat it? Anybody here ever had ibuprofen? <laughs> it's a pain-free university. There's a... <laughs> Obviously, everybody. Well, what you're doing is you are blocking the COX enzyme. It's exactly what you're doing. And it works. It just doesn't work well enough, and you have a problem of not being able to take enough. And of course, it's not only good for hand pain, for back pain, for knee pain, neck pain, you name it. Any of those joint pains that we're all going to eventually get, and you're going to turn to the ibuprofen. The problem are adverse side effects. Wouldn't it be great if we could just pour enough in to just block the COX enzyme in the place that we want it without adverse side effects? But it doesn't happen. And the or, and I love to tell this story, I tell the medical students, is I gave a talk to the public one day and I was talking about how ibuprofen works. I said, you have a COX enzyme in your joint, you take it and it relieves the pain, it blocks the enzyme. And somebody in the audience said, I think I have a dumb question. Is it? There's no dumb questions. What is it? And the person said, how does the aspirin know where to go? <laughs> I said, That's brilliant. I said, you've just discovered why we have side effects. The aspirin hasn't got a clue where to go. You put it in your mouth, it goes everywhere, and anywhere there's a cox enzyme, it's going to block it. Morphine? Morphine doesn't know that it only needs to go to block the opiate receptor that's involved in pain. It'll go to the gut and give you constipation. It'll, go to, it'll give you a high if it goes to the limbic system. If it goes to your respiratory system, it'll shut it off and you'll die. Okay? It doesn't know where to go. So therapeutic window and targeting is something else we need to really seriously consider. One other important thing, and this I'm excited about because it's on the horizon. When you have tissue injury, it's not just prostaglandin synthesis that's involved. The joint is a mess. This is just a small illustration of what happens in the setting of tissue injury. You have a flow of, you have vasodilatation and uh, plasma extravasation and a whole variety of cells, cytokines, tissue, uh, plasma uh, gets released into the injury site and changes the whole chemical milieu. And released from these cells are a whole variety of we assume molecules that are involved in the re uh, repair process, but many of them actually cause problems. And one of the most interesting is nerve growth factor, NGF. Nerve growth factor, turns out if you inject it, it actually causes pain. It's involved in the development of nerves. We all know that. Well, very exciting on the horizon. On the early horizon are antibodies to nerve growth factor. 
Antibodies to nerve growth factor are now have been through their in phase three trials. The data looks really pretty spectacular. Uh, and let me just show you one slide that illustrates this. They had a, a, a rough early start because of side effects. The FDA put hold, but then they released them, released it, and now it's back. And my prediction is that this may be approved in a couple, literally within two years. For things like osteoarthritis, knee, hip, maybe back pain, bone meth pain, which is the worst you can get. This study was published in 2010 in New England Journal. It's a remarkable study. Two injections of antibodies to NGF, and you get relief. This is now, if you will, pain, decrease in pain starting here. Here's placebo. Placebos work, by the way, and they, they're also one of the reasons why it's so difficult to come up with a new drug, because it's got to be better than placebo. But here's the anti-NGF, and we're talking, here's the, 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 the double dose, the higher dose compared to placebo, and look at this. This is weeks, so this is four months of relief after two injections of antibodies to nerve growth factor. Several companies have this. I expect it will be probably approved within a couple of years. Very exciting. Will it completely replace morphine? No. Will it make a difference? I think so, and I hope so. Um, what about a better morphine? I mean, should we just throw the baby out with the bathwater? This is the question. Well. Can we come up, when I say we, it's not, it's not what my lab studies, can, can you come up with a, a morphine drug that is actually does all the good things, blocks pain, but doesn't have the side effects? That would be the drug that we're all looking for. That, would make, that doesn't have the misuse potential that is the, the bane of the, of the, of the uh, use of opioids. Well, what does the crystal ball say? <laughs> Biased agonism. Uh, biased agonism is the latest uh, phrase, very hot word. We had a, a, had a great discussion with John Trainer about this. So what is biased agonism? The idea is as follows. So under normal conditions, morphine binds a GPCR, the mu opioid receptor. And here's the mu opioid receptor. And when morphine binds it, it has a cascade of events. We won't go into the details. Decreases cyclic A. And you get pain relief, analgesia. That's the good news. The problem is morphine also binds a lot of other things when it binds, uh, the receptor is coupled to beta arrestins, and these, there's evidence, mediates many of the adverse side effects. At least that's what the story is, that's what the hypothesis, and that's what is being built upon. So the idea then is you want to get rid of this. If you could block this and eliminate this, then you'd have pure analgesia. Wouldn't that be wonderful if you could also prevent the misuse side effect? And there's some data in the literature now. A new paper just came out in Cell from Laura Bone. This is an older paper of hers in Science. And very briefly, this is pain relief. And suffice it to say, this is what happens when you give the morphine in an animal in which you've knocked out the beta arrestin. You actually get much more prolonged pain relief and the question is, what about the side effects? There was a really exciting paper in Nature that just came out last year from Maglicadol. And what they're showing here, this is now looking at side effects, constipation. Constipation, I love that. I'm going to take a, a, a second to ask this, because I always ask my medical students. How many people in the audience have ever had diarrhea? <laughs> It's, again, an unbelievably low incidence of diarrhea amongst medical professionals. There are three people put their hands up. Um, medical students, nobody ever puts their hand up. How do you treat it? It's an opiate. Loperamide. Uh, Imodium is an opiate that is not able to stay in the central nervous system. It's kicked out by transporters. It just shuts down the gut. You block the you block the uh, excessive movement in your gut, and you block the di you prevent diarrhea. In that case, the effect is what you want. In this case, constipation is a side effect you don't want. So a patient taking high doses of narcotics for cancer will sometimes come off the drug because the constipation is just oppressive. It's a side effect that they don't want. So in this case, what you find is that 
This is now fecal bowl, so this is inverse diarrhea, if you will. And the uh, morphine produces very few fecal pellets. In other words, they're, they're constipated. Uh, and then this drug, which is a modified uh, agonist based on structure, it's an opioid agonist, it produces much more fecal pellets. In other words, the gut is working much better. And it maintains its analgesic potency. And then the biggie in respiratory depression, which is what is killing people, same idea, here's morphine, this is respiratory frequency, morphine shuts things off and eventually the, uh, the individual will die, and the PZM21 compound reduces respiratory depression. Clearly more work needs to be done, but this is a direction that is very exciting. Take advantage of chemistry, structure, and develop a drug that might actually have selective effects. What about neuropathic pain, which is the area that I'm most interested in? This is an individual with complex regional pain syndrome. It's a horrible condition caused perhaps by minor nerve injury. These are nerve injury associated pains. Ongoing burning pain, redness, sympathetic problems, and incredible hypersensitivity, mechanical hypersensitivity. These are individuals who are not opiate sensitive, but they'll sometimes turn to opiates because nothing else is working. Um, this is one of the more memorable covers of the journal Pain. This was a, uh, an individual who was a sculptor, and he had complex regional pain syndrome, and he's trying to illustrate what he was experiencing. The big problem with pain is you can't see it. Chronic pain patients are walking around miserably, and you don't see them. It's not like somebody who's in a wheelchair, and you know right away they have a neurological problem. That's what's going on here. This person says it's like having razor blades in their, in their, in their uh, leg, and he needs, he needs help. Um, we need something, why do we need something new? You know, there are so many ways. We have, I've had wonderful discussions with the folks in the pain clinic here. Um, you say, why are we having this talk? Uh, so this is a diagram. Let me just list some of the things that are used in patients with neuropathic pain. First choice, gabapentinoids. Uh, topical local anesthetics, nerve block, TENS, transcutaneous stimulation, cannabinoids. I put a question mark because uh, we may have discussion. I'm, 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 I'm not convinced yet about cannabinoids. Spinal cord stimulation, uh, uptake inhibitors. There's so many choices. Why are we having this discussion? Oh, oh I forgot. And complementary medicine, whether it's from acupuncture to you name it, are used in these individuals. What's the problem? The problem is that these are 30% effective in 30% of patients, the best ones. And these are blockbuster drugs. So what it means is 70% of the patients are not being adequately treated. And even when they are treated, they have too much pain left over. So clearly, we need something new. And what I'd like to suggest, and I'm going to, uh, this is some work in our lab, just to summarize a little bit of where are we, we are going. It's a new view of looking at pain. The traditional view with, say, neuropathic pain is you have nerve damage, and you get neuropathic pain. And how do you treat it? Well, you try to throw a drug at it that will shut down what is basically the symptom, the pain. Right? Well, the alternative is to say, now wait a second, let's think of neuropathic pain not as a symptom of something, but it's actually a disease of the nervous system. It's an alteration in the nervous system that's been damaged, and its only manifestation is this very difficult to treat pain. So if you think of it as a disease, then perhaps you could repair the disease, fix the, the disease, and then in that way treat the pain. And so what does the crystal ball say? Maybe you can actually repair the disease, rebuild the nervous system. And that's what I want to tell you about at the end. And our approach is, what is the disease? It's very straightforward, and it's very much like, if you will, uh, epilepsy, like seizures. This is a half of a spinal cord. We have an afferent fiber. There's our nociceptor, contains glutamate. And I threw in a few inhibitory interneurons in the spinal cord that regulate the output. We know when there's nerve damage that you can actually lose that inhibition, maybe even lose the cells. As a result of that, you get more pain. Because everything that's coming in is now unregulated, you get more pain. Very characteristic. How do you treat this? Well, treat it like epilepsy. You use anticonvulsants because that's exactly the problem in seizures is you lose inhibition in the cortex. And that's the best there is. Gabapentinoids are anticonvulsants and you hope to reduce the pain. Not uh, uh, adequate enough, obviously. So our hypothesis, well, maybe we could treat and by rebuilding, by literally putting back GABAergic progenitors and add back the GABA inhibition. And I'll tell you how we do this. 
Uh, it began with uh, studies in the um, uh, lab of, of uh, John Rubenstein, a psychiatrist at UCSF who studies the origins of uh, cells in the brain, neurons in the brain. And what he showed many years ago is all of the GABAergic interneurons come from a region of the brain, of the embryonic brain, this is a mouse, the medial ganglionic eminence. The names don't matter. These cells are born around E12. The mouse has a 21-day gestation period. And then they fill the cortex. And when they published this wonderful paper, Scott Baraban, which is what got me excited. What they did is they took cells from a mouse in which all of those MG cells, the GABAergic progenitors, uh, were green so they could follow them. They had GFP. And they transplanted them at that time into a neonatal two-day-old mouse brain. And they waited until the animal grew up, and they have got green cells that looked like GABAergic interneurons. It was beautiful. And they could put them in the occipital cortex, and they would fill the entire cortex. That was pretty cool. But what was exciting to me is in that paper, they did the same experiment in a mouse that had a potassium channel defect, loss of function, and that animal had high seizure propensity, would seize continuously. They transplanted, and they were able to reduce the numbers of seizures. Now remember, I said that I see neuropathic pain as a seizure-like condition, spinal cord, brainstem. And I went to John, I like to tell the story, I went to John, I said, John, this is beautiful. Um, do you think we could try it in, for pain? He said, yeah, you, you know, you can try anything. Uh, it won't work. Um, I said, why not? He said, well, you want to put it into an adult spinal cord. And these are, we've only done it at that time in the neonate, and it's the wrong environment. It won't take. Okay, what else? Um, it's the wrong environment. It's the spinal cord. You know, these are not GABAergic spinal. This is cortex, so it even it won't work. Okay, and his colleague, Arturo Avalis Bure, said, yeah, even if you get them to survive in the court, which he didn't think they would, um, their, their um, ET come home cells, they're going to go right back to the cortex. That's what they do. I said, oh, so I went to Joel Braz, a brilliant fellow in the lab, and I, of course, I told him that we have this great idea. Everyone's telling me it's, it's going to work. I didn't. <laughs> You have to lie sometimes. I didn't tell him, and Joao tried it. I wouldn't be here I'm telling you this. It works. Uh, so the, here's the model. We have a spinal cord. We have afferent fibers. Uh, whoops. We have an afferent, and we have lots of uh, projection neurons that carry the message to the brain, the yellow cells. And I threw in a lot of inhibitory interneurons. I told you that when you cut the, spine, cut the afferent, that you can lose these cells. So what we do is we take 50,000 cells from the embryonic mouse brain, from the MGE, transplant them, and see what happens. And the question is, can they survive? And this is Joao Braz, who's been with, working with me for many years. He's a brilliant, initially an immunologist, virologist, and now a neuro neuroscientist. So this is what it looks like after you put it in the cells one day after transplant. This is a spinal cord. Here's the dorsal horn for the aficionados. Here's the ventral horn. And you get a plug. And then you come back one day, one month later, and the cells have now moved out. They do not go to the opposite side. They sure as hell don't go to the cortex, uh, so that we didn't have to worry. Uh, and this is what one cell could look like. They're very happy cells. They survive. They put out processes. Uh, and we follow them now for up to six months. Um, are they synaptically connected? My colleague in Australia, Ida Llewellyn Smith, does the work. This is a way to take the cells to the electron microscopic level. This is what the cells look like. And for people who know uh, cortex, these look like cortical GABAergic neurons. They do not become spinal cord neurons. This is what one of them looks like. She takes this cell to the electron microscopic level. And what you see is these cells make beautiful synapses. This is the host axon talking to a transplant. So this is not uh, just a, a cells that are living and not connecting. These are making synapses. And then you can see that they actually receive and they talk to the host. Six months, they're talking to the uh, dendrites of the host. They are integrated. And most importantly, can they actually treat a condition of hypersensitivity? We use a model of neuropathic pain. In the mouse, you have the branches of the sciatic. You cut two of the three branches, and the animal becomes incredibly hypersensitive through the remaining branch, just like the human. And this is what we did. This is now the threshold for withdrawing to a mechanical stimulus. Normalized. You injure. The threshold drops. Then we transplant. 
and you follow the animals blindly over time, and by one month, the animals that receive the transplant versus dead cells or medium, they completely normalize. They are completely normal. We never get analgesia, but they actually recover. We've repeated this many times. And what we conclude is that you can uh, uh, treat. It's not just a sophisticated pump. A lot of transplant work is being done, and the assumption is you're just releasing a lot of goodies, a lot of neurotransmitters, like DOPA in the case of a nigral transplant for Parkinson's. These are integrating and, we think, rebuilding circuits. Uh, and we believe it's disease-modifying. We've now treated chemotherapy-induced models of hypersensitivity. Um, and chronic itch, I, uh, Huda said it would be interesting to discuss this. Interesting, you give morphine to a patient, you block pain, and you also produce itch. And itch, people don't realize, is a huge clinical condition that's unmet clinical need, often related to loss of inhibition. Here's an individual baby with atopic dermatitis, does not respond to antihistamines. It's a horrible condition, very difficult to treat. We got a hold of an animal model. This is what the skin looks like. You've got so-called acanthosis with epidermal thickening. This is normal skin. Um, this is a model in which uh, a cytokine, interleukin-31, is overexpressed in skin, and the animals develop a Th2 cell-dependent chronic itch model of atopic dermatitis. And I'm going to show you these. They're a little bit difficult to, to watch, but it just illustrates the power of the transplant reorganization. Can we use these transplants to treat this model of atopic dermatitis? This is an animal that starts to scratch and will never stop. And then eventually we would have to euthanize them. We transplanted on one side and waited. And you can tell which side we transplanted. The, the animal stops scratching and the, the skin heals. And just that it's not one example, here's another one. And the paper's published in JCI. Um, it is effective. This is, I show it because it visually demonstrates the power of the transplants. What's next? Well, um, get tired of the crystal ball. So I said, go to a fortune teller. And there happened to be a fortune teller living right next to my daughter when she lived in San Francisco. They're all over the place. Uh, <laughs> And I saw this sign, Psychic Fair Cancelled. <laughs> I said, well, what the hell? Due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> so I figured this is not the fortune teller to go to for a good idea. So back to the crystal ball. And I will tell you, there's a lot of things on the horizon. Antibodies to CGRP, I didn't have time to, it's a peptide. It is going to potentially revolutionize the treatment of migraine because CGRP is a peptide released in the periphery, causes vasodilation that triggers migraines. They've been through phase three, several successful phase three trials. It looks good. They will be approved in the probably not too distant future for migraine. They're not only a uh, block of migraine, but they also reduce the incidence of migraine, prophylactic, which anybody in the audience who has migraine know how important that is. Um, trend, uh, TMS, uh, cortical stimulation, vagal stimulation treats almost anything. I don't understand how it works, but whether it's pain or depression or epilepsy. The big hope is for a biomarker of pain. We had a great discussion at lunch about this. We can't measure pain other than asking the patient. Wouldn't it be great if we had an objective measure that we could monitor success? We need that. There's new studies in chemogenetics to regulate and modify uh, the properties of neurons. Obviously, optogenetics are being introduced wirelessly, and I see the future for this in the treatment of pain. So I'm excited about the possibilities. Finally, I show you this slide. It's an important slide. Pretty much everything I've talked to you about today is, is reducing the transmission of the messages that the brain interprets as pain. As, as the introduction talked about beauty, and what I was talking about when I wrote about that is when somebody looks at a Mondrian painting, somebody appreciates what went into it, the Mondrian, his history, and they're willing to spend $50 million to buy the thing. Somebody else looks at it, you know, I can make it on, in Photoshop, uh, and they don't get it. It's the same stimulus, but there's an emotional impact to the experience that's a perception of beauty. Pain is that. Pain is not just the injury stimulus. It's the interpretation and the emotional coloring of the experience. And the brain, in other words, there's a brain involved. This is a cover of a woman who had a stroke, post-stroke pain. People don't realize it's quite common. 
This is a woman who's an artist. She painted this here with a red background, and she writes about it in the, in the article. No problem. But when she tried to paint it with a blue background, she, she was in excruciating pain in her painting arm, as if her hand was in the freezer the whole time. But she was stubborn. She wanted to get it done. This woman, there's nothing wrong intellectually with, with this woman. It just illustrates the complexity of the pain experience. And so I think at some point we need to get up to the brain and do something different. Stay right here. We have questions for you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Okay, so we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions and answers. 10 minutes, I think. And the, the idea is to be pretty wide-ranging. Obviously, Alan covered a lot of different topics, both opioids and non-opioids, even though the topic is about opioids and, and for, fortune-telling and pain. <laughs> so uh, anybody wants to start? Come on, don't be shy. We need you. Oh, are, is I'm some, sorry. Somebody sending me messages? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Terry Robbins. I'm not going to know everybody's name, by the Hi, way. Terry. Very nice talk. Um, so, one question. I mean, there's a two, two parts here to the symposium. One has to do with pain, and the other has to do with the opioid crisis, which is an addiction problem. So, the question becomes, if in medicine you got rid of opiates altogether because of some of the things you talk about uh, in terms of treating pain, what would, would be the consequence for the addiction problem with opioids? Well, the question is, what is the rationale for using opioids in the first place? Um, if, if the problem is the opioids and you say you come up with something other than pain, then the question is, why would you want to use opioids? Uh, now somebody, because remember, 50% of the opioid problem is pres prescription driven. All right, so presumably that would be eliminated if you never prescribe another opioid. Now one thing that's really important, if this is not a worldwide problem. This is a problem in the United States. The opioids are used to an enormously greater extent here than in any other country in the world. All right, so the opioids are prescribed for pain here. So if we come up with something other than an opioid, you should eliminate that problem. Now, the other problem of the addiction that comes in through opioids coming in from abroad or, or whatever reason, because there's a financial uh, incentive for some groups to, for, to push opioids, that's not what I'm dealing with. Uh, I am willing to, uh, I, I actually don't have answers to those questions. I think those are sociopolitical, they're economic problems. I think the prescription things, if I were to come up with one recommendation for the opioid epidemic vis-a-vis -vis pain, is have a national registry of uh, prescriptions, which is what they have in Europe. Uh, so that somebody writes a prescription in California and someone in New York knows about it. Somebody in Alabama, somebody in Michigan knows that you can't just go doctor shopping within your own state or even across state lines. That's number one. And that would, I think, then you, the only way, the drugs you could come up with would be illicit drugs. And then the other issues that get very controversial is the, you know, prescribe, you prescribe for a month, you prescribe for three days. And that's, you know, some patients will get very upset when they find out they can only get a prescription for three days. That's another issue that I personally don't have an answer for. But I'm not sure if your question is, are we still going to have a, a misuse problem because opioids will still exist? Then you have to address the people who are saying, well, where are those opioids coming into the country and who's getting them? And I don't think that's, that's going to be a very different problem. That's not a, I don't see that as a health problem. I think the health problem is once the person becomes dependent, then you have to deal with that disease, which is a very different disease. Yeah. Such as to neuro affects other modalities. Yeah, in the case in the case of the, the, the traumatic injury model that we use, mechanical hypersensitivity and cold are the only things we get, and we can deal with it. In the chemotherapy, it's a taxol model, quite a standard model. The animals are both. What's very interesting, they become thermal heat, cold, and mechanically hypersensitive for limbs and hind limbs because, of course, this is a systemic treatment, just like the patient. We transplant on one side, and we can completely reverse the heat and the mechanical only on that side. This is not a systemic treatment. It is very local treatment. So yes, it's not modality specific. So I have another question. So serotonergic neurons has been also shown to modulate the, the 
since, uh, you know, since September, there's no order transplantation of those neurons, actually. That was difficult. The question was, repeat the question, I agree. Uh, the question was uh, serotonergic neurons, which originate in the brainstem, and I cut my teeth early, early days on that, yes. uh, have been used, um, will also be used in transplant studies, mostly for motor system issues. Um, and I think the answer is probably no, that they would not be effective. And because in, in the case of the trans, the serotonin, remember it's targeting, I think the latest count is 14 different receptors. And some of them are, if you will, pronosusceptive. The 5-HT3 receptor in particular is an ionotropic excitatory receptor. And so if it starts hitting the 5-HT3 receptor, it's actually going to cause more pain. So I think you've got to figure out a way to get receptor selectivity in the case of the serotonergic drugs. And as much as I was grown up on the belief that 5-HT, by and large, inhibits pain, <laughs> recent data argues that, in fact, there is a facilitatory effect. And so it's not a direction I would go. Eva? Yeah, I thought your uh, transplant data was really very interesting. Um, because uh, it has been shown that you can transplant neural progenitor cells safely into the spinal cord of patients, um, are there any discussions in terms of actually translating what you found, uh, you know, in mirroring models into patients? Yeah, absolutely, in two ways. And uh, number one, so there is a company, I'm on the scientific advisory board, I'm not part of it otherwise than that, called Neurona. I did have a slide that illustrated my thing, so I'm happy to send it to everybody. Um, but this is a company that plans to take, they're the ones that we originally got the idea from, in, in, and they started this, this uh, company with the intention of developing human embryonic stem cells or iPS cells modified to become GABAergic uh, interneurons, initially for epilepsy, for intractable epilepsy or epilepsy where, where you've got eloquent cortex, where you, it's a, you just cannot cut it out because it, it might have effects on, on uh, language, for example. We, with their help, we have transplanted to date, we haven't published it yet, we have transplanted hum, human embryonic stem cells that have become, turned into GABAergic interneurons. Uh, they're, they're fed in, in vitro and then we transplant and they are effective. Uh, they take much longer to have any effect, two months, we followed them for six you mean months. in humans? It, no, in, in animals. Okay. We trans, sorry, we transplanted, thank you, into skin mice so they have no immune system, otherwise they would reject the cells. The difference is that the cells can't be transplanted after they become GABAergic interneurons, they won't take. So you feed them, you turn them, get the goodies, turn them into GABAergic neurons or en route, transplant, then they turn into neurons in, in, in vivo, and then over time they'll develop. We get about a 50% recovery at six months compared to 100%. So the answer is yes, it can work. And to date, it's not quite as good, but of course we're doing it in a skid mouse, but that's the direction it's going. And absolutely, I would love to see the day when this could be effective for the treating these conditions. Uh, I would also say that things like, most people don't realize that you see someone in a wheelchair, 70% of those individuals have intractable pain. Nothing works, horrible. I believe that this approach could be useful in spinal cord injury pain as well. So I have a question. So um, I, as you were talking, I kept thinking about the fact that pain might have a trajectory, that it might be acute and then become chronic, and it might have engaged different mechanisms. And do you see a time window for these different treatments? Is there, a, a, and especially the affective component that you ended yeah. up on? It's a very, the question was, uh, is there some kind of temporal development of chronic pain? Uh, and it's a major question. I just chaired, co-chaired a major government committee to develop uh, a future of uh, pain, uh, the pr pain research priorities. And one of the five working groups was the transition from acute to chronic pain. Mm -hmm. It's a big question. Does all chronic pain begin as acute pain? Or is it possible that in fact, Chronic pain begins from the moment in some people that they actually get the injury. Everyone assumes that you go acute, but it may actually be that what's there all that you're you're chronic all along. Are there conditions in which there are resolution mechanisms that occur in the majority of people who then don't go on to chronic pain, and it's those individuals who lose the resolution mechanism are the ones that go on to chronic pain. It's turning the whole system on its head. So I believe there is a transition uh, issue. There may be a predisposition factor. We had a great discussion at lunch 
20, 40 percent, hard to say, of individuals who have surgery, they're perfectly well treated, perhaps post-op with, with opiates, and then you send them home, and then many of them go on to having chronic pain that's very difficult to manage. Uh, and so there are individual differences. The individual who is a catastrophizer, who anticipates things are going to be miserable, that individual probably is predisposed to having a chronic pain condition. So pain is in the brain, and so it's not just the amount of injury, it's not just what's going on in the spinal cord, it's the interpretation, it's the history that that individual has, it's the family support system that that individual has that is going to all contribute to all of these things. So it's, it's, a, it's a really uh, tough challenge uh, and one, I, I would, I'm going to throw this out because I think one of the major unanswered questions still is the following with respect to opioids. Very effective in many patients for acute pain, post-op pain. Very effective or necessary in a patient with intractable cancer pain who's going to die. To withhold opiates from that individual is, uh, is negligence. All right. What about all the part in the middle of the patient with non-cancer chronic pain, back pain particularly, osteoarthritis, etc.? There is one group that believes that it's effective and the patients may become tolerant or may not, and another group, and I won't mention names, but very close colleagues of mine who absolutely believe that these drugs should never be used, that they are not effective for chronic non-cancer pain. One of the big problems is you don't, there are no tri good trials. When does pain become chronic? The sort of knee-jerk reason, three months, is, if it lasts three months, it's now chronic. Well, who came up with that number? <laughs> is it two months? Is it one month? Is it two weeks that it's chronic? Yeah. These are difficult yeah. questions. Jill and then Victor. So here's another difficult question, and that is, as, as you know, there are sex differences in the pain response, and there are sex differences in the response to opioids. So how do you put... That, and there are sex differences in addiction to opioids. So all of these things are well, it's just important one considerations. Yeah. That, and that we now, because, I shouldn't say because, we recognize that it was always important. And I know you work very well, and, and we are now looking at male-female differences, in part because I'm interested in it, in part because I'm well aware of the opioid differences, but also because the NIH said, if you don't do it, we're not going to fund you. And that, was, that was a very strong incentive. But of course, it costs twice as much money to do those studies, but we're doing them. I do believe there's a difference. The, one of the, I didn't have time to get into it, one of the major topics now is immune uh, interactions with the nervous system. It's a hot topic, and there's some provocative data coming originally out of Jeff Mogul's group. We are looking at it that there are different immune-mediated mechanisms that intervene between an opiate and the nervous system, whether it's microglia or T cells or whatever it is, and there, these male-female differences need to, be, need to be studied. And of course, to the extent that there's an opiate difference in the response to a painful situation, then you have questions about tolerance, Dependence. They're not the same thing, as you know. And so, yes, to ignore it is to your peril uh, and in many different ways. So we are looking at it. It's difficult. Victor, I think it's your last, the last question. So thank you very much. And since I'm not with the microphone, I'll stand up. Um, I think it's very clear from your presentation that, of course, there are many mediators and pathways of pain. And in fact, the future may lie in understanding what is causing what pain, therefore having more targeted therapy. Mm -hmm. The issue about uh, chronic use of opioids, certainly in our studies when we look at the data, there's no evidence that opioids are useful for chronic treatment of chronic pain, except for the condition we talk about, which is cancer pain. So it's clear that first, uh, I believe that opioids should not be used for chronic pain, okay. and so for short-term acute pain, and whether there's a way to dissect out which to use for different types of pain, your idea of precision pain treatment in the future. And finally, the issue of what is addictive versus not. See, there, it seems to me the range of choices you have up there, many of them may or may not be addictive, probably not. And therefore, being able to, a good clinical study, look at what type of pain, what's the most effective treatment that doesn't cause uh, addiction would be very useful. I completely agree. Let me end by just telling you a quick story. 
Uh, and it's really relevant, and I will mention the name now, since you, you said that you're on that side of the fence. I organized a meeting in Maastricht not, just a couple of years ago, the World Institute of Pain. I was on the help to put it together. These are very interventionalist, very aggressive docs. Uh, and I decided to invite Jane Ballantyne. Now, Jane Ballantyne is a pain physician, um, lives in Boston, but she, she was in Seattle for many years. Uh, and I invited her to talk, and I know her, her opinions about opiates. She completely agrees with you that, that uh, opiates are not effective for non-cancer chronic pain. And of course, people in the audience, many of them used it, not to mention other things. She got up and started talking, and within five minutes, she was stopped. Someone literally, there were 2,000 people in the audience, said, what are you talking about? She's talking about the opioid epidemic. Said, it's not a problem in Europe. This is not a European problem. First of all, we don't use opiates the way you use opiates. It's an American problem. So what are you t why are you here? I mean, it was, it was pretty rough. <laughs> I'm sure they were pretty tough on her. But it ended up a dialogue. It was a wonderful dialogue that really taught me a lot. And we got into the issues. Who's responsible? Well, it's the patient who demands more opiates because they, they have a pain problem. It's the uh, government that doesn't control the drugs, either entry or the registries. It's the pharmaceutical industry, of course, that is wanting to sell drugs. It's the insurance industry that is perfectly happy to sell Vicodin because it's cheap. If we come up with a new drug that costs $50 a pill as opposed to 10 cents for a Vicodin, well, you know, which one am I going to prescribe? Um, so everybody has a little piece of the action, but it was so interesting that they said, this is not a European problem, this is an American problem. And I think we need to look at it and what is it about this country that makes us so dependent upon the use of opiates uh, and it's, everyone's got a piece of this puzzle that has to be uh, uh, put together. And I think that's a good place to that's start. That's a great segue to the yeah. next segment, but meanwhile, thank you so much, yeah. Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, for our next uh, segment, we have a fantastic panel uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, I did want to set this up. We did want to set this up with uh, two different uh, audience response questions. Uh, just to, for a warm up, we'll do one. And then I'll, uh, the idea of these is to get your opinions. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, well, there might be some wrong answers, but there's no single right answer. Uh, and. Um, it will inform the panelists also of, of issues they might discuss. So if you haven't already, please text Rosenthal to this number, 22333. And are you ready? All right, so here's the warm-up. <laughs> Jim Harbaugh, the football coach's khakis, are from Brooks Brothers, custom-made, <laughs> Lululemon, or provided to him by Nike. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you'll start responding, uh, your responses will be shown here. Well, and you know, they, they move around a little bit. <laughs> All right, they seem to have, well, they're almost settled out. Um, I was a big surprise to me and told these they are indeed Lululemon, whatever that brand is. Uh, so those of you who, who guessed that. Yo yoga. Uh, yoga. <laughs> all right, so um, let's go to the, the first real question. Um, and um, this is uh, sort of complicated answers, uh, but uh, I'll let you read through them. I won't uh, uh, read through them for you, but they're different um, options that are quite relevant to the first two presentations we will have. And you can only have one answer. You can change your answer, but you can only have one. So uh, I think we get the gist of this one. I'm not going to comment on it, but leave that to our panelists. Um, and with that, let me ask panelists to come forward. Thank, thank you for participating in these. We'll have one more question before the second two panelists. Um, please, please come up. Uh, and I'll introduce our panelists as they're coming forward. Um, Dr. Richard Miek, I think maybe is close. Uh, 
who is um, a research professor for youth and social issues at our Institute for Social Research. His work focuses on substance abuse and uh, how these trends are impacted by age, historical period, and birth co cohort. Uh, the next speaker is going to be Dr. Chad Brummett, Director of the Division of Pain Research and Director of, the Clin of Clinical Research in the Department of Anesthesiology. His areas of research include predictors of chronic pain after surgery and why interventions and surgeries to reduce pain are not always effective. Uh, also is uh, on our panel, next will be Dr. Shelley Flegel, an assistant professor of psychiatry and research associate professor in the Molecular and Behavioral Neurosciences Institute. Her work fo focuses on individual differences in vulnerability to addiction and the neurobiology of motivated behavior. And our uh, final panelist who will speak is Dr. John Trainer, associate chair for research and professor in the Department of Pharmacology. Uh, his interests include characterizing the mechanism of action in strong analgesic drugs and identifying novel targets, medications to treat pain, drug dependence, and, dep and depression. So uh, thank you all, and uh, Richard, you're on. Well, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me here today. It's a great opportunity to share some of my research with you all. So these are going to be short presentations, about five to seven minutes each. Something to shoot at, I guess, uh, for the audience. And um, uh, each of us are coming from different disciplines because this is an uh, issue, the opioid epidemic and pain relief that uh, crosses over many disciplines. So I'm going to start off with more of an epidemiological approach, kind of the broad approach, the society approach. And um, then we're going to narrow down uh, all the way down to receptors with the other panelists, not me. OK, so what I want to talk about today is a research question that goes, do legitimate opioid prescriptions for youth place them at risk to misuse opioids in the future? Hang on this here. So this is important to know. Uh, for the risk side of the risk-benefit calculation for opioid use, which uh, we heard about at the beginning of the talk today of the symposium. Um, and it's particularly important in light of uh, some research of, uh, or some positions, papers, of people who have since been named, that uh, the American Academy of Neurology has recently published a position paper stating that the risk of opioids outweigh the benefits for certain conditions, such as chronic back pain. So. Uh, is there a risk, both at the individual level and the public health level, when youth are given opioid prescriptions, that they will go on to misuse opioids in the future? And uh, to get that down specifically, I'm going to look at 12th grade students. I'm going to find, I'm going to ask how many of them have ever had a legitimate opioid prescription, and then I'm going to follow them uh, to age 23 and ask them if they have misused opioids. So the data for the study comes from a project here at the University of Michigan at the Institute for Social Research called Monitoring the Future. I'm the principal investigator. It's nationally representative survey of adolescents. We survey 40,000 8th, 10th, and 12th graders total, not, not each, uh, annually about uh, use of more than 50 types of um, uh, drugs and categories of drugs. These are in-school surveys. We go throughout the country to all the 48 contiguous states and ask students these questions. And uh, among the 12th graders that we interview, we enroll a subgroup, a random subgroup, for a panel study. And we follow them up. And we keep asking them questions until they tell us to go away and stop asking them questions anymore. <laughs> and uh, for this study, I'm going to focus on 6,220 12th graders who are followed up to age 23. And we have a response rate of 71% among our 12th graders um, surveyed, which is pretty good for this type of thing. And this is a good example of how this project, which is uh, at its heart a surveillance project to look at which drugs are gaining traction among adolescents and which ones are falling out of favor. Um, and uh, we can also, with these data, do hypothesis testing, which is basically what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to skip skate to the, straight to the results. This is my last slide. Uh, the results that uh, uh, overall, 12th graders who report that they had ever had a prescription, a legitimate prescription for opioid, which is about 15% of all 12th graders. 
they were significantly more likely in the future to report that they had misused opioids by age 23. And uh, two important caveats there. Uh, the first is that I'm talking about misusing opioids. I'm not talking about full-fledged addiction or dependence. Um, we don't have the sample size to study that. Um, so these are people who report, uh, most of them, the, the vast majority said they misused opioids about five times in the past year. So we're not talking about daily uh, misuse or addiction. So this is not addiction, but it, probably a path on the way there. Well, the second thing is that not only did we ask them if they misused opioids, but we asked them why. Why did you do that? We gave them a list of options. And more than 70% said it was to get high or it was to relax. So this isn't just people who ended up in pain at some future point in time and they had an old prescription, they decided to do some kind of self-medication or pain relief. Uh, for the most part, these are people who are using the opioids uh, for recreational purposes. <laughs> okay, so uh, this was not a randomized controlled study. Uh, it's, it's not ethical to randomly distribute opioids to adolescents and see what happens. <laughs> so uh, this is a quasi-experimental study, which means we have to control for possible pre-existing differences among those 12th graders who had and did not have uh, legitimate opioid prescriptions. And so in particular, what we're, what we're interested in is the continuum some 12th graders are drug naive. They've never used tobacco or alcohol or marijuana, and they're strongly anti-drug. And at the other end of the continuum are uh, heavy drug users uh, in 12th grade, people who are smoking marijuana every day. So what we wanted to know is this 33% figure up here, is it stronger on some parts of the continuum than others? And this is where I thought it got very interesting and also somewhat counterintuitive, at least for me. So it turns out uh, you take the 12th graders who had very little substance use experience and they believed illicit drugs to be very harmful. For them, this 33%, it was much stronger. Among this group, those who had had a legitimate opioid prescription were two to three times more likely to misuse opioids than those who did not have a legitimate opioid prescription. Um, and I have that here in the next slide, or the next uh, bullet. Uh, and interestingly, among the 12th graders who had a lot of drug experience, there was no effect of an opioid prescription on future misuse. So what's happening with these 12th graders, this heavy drug use group, is that they're very likely to go on to misuse opioids. It doesn't matter if they ever had a legitimate opioid prescription or not. They're just very likely uh, to do so. One minute. Thank you. Um, so that's what I say there. So I have two take-home points um, that I uh, hope to convey to you today. The first is that uh, the group of adolescents who are drug naive, who have very little drug use experience, they are a group of concern when prescribing opioids. And they don't often receive as much attention as the heavy drug using adolescents do. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, consistent with that point, a corollary is that presumably this group, the drug naive group, would be very open to education programs. Uh, the doctors, we could develop a script, perhaps. Uh, they'd be very open to what the doctors have to say, and they could be warned, and I think they would take the warning to heart about the potential dangers of misusing opioids in a way that they're not intended to use. And my second point is a more general one, and that is that you can take the same opioids and give them to a bunch of different people. They will have different effects. And so this is just a very simple example of that. And my colleagues in psychiatry and psychology and medicine, they have much more sophisticated and more developed models and findings about the interactions between individuals and opioids, and um, they can present those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Chad Brummett. I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm also a pain physician. And uh, I, I'm going to be, in this five minutes, trying to present uh, some of our newer work. I do a lot of work in mechanisms of, of acute and chronic pain, opioid responsiveness. I've worked with Dan Claw and the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center looking at post-surgical pain. But I'm going to be talking about something today that's really kind of blossomed over the last year, the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network. My co-directors of that program are Jennifer Walgie from Plastic Surgery, Hand Surgery, and Mike Inglesby from Transplant Surgery. So our group was very interested in, in, in thinking about opioid addiction, abuse, and even chronic use in a very different way. We felt like, as a group, the whole country is really focused up here. What to do with the chronic opioid user or the patient with chronic pain and whether or not opioids are appropriate, and how to deal with opioids that are diverted in the community and medication-assisted treatment 
incredibly important questions, absolutely appropriate for future study and additional work, future funding. However, we felt like there was a big gap, an incredible gap, and that is to say no one was really looking to figure out how people were getting to that point. What, this question beyond primary care and the CDC guidelines did a terrific job of coming out and saying, here's when it's appropriate to prescribe for chronic pain. And this really addressed it uh, at primary care physicians and chronic pain physicians, because that's where the data exists. And there were very little data for a, an exposure that is incredibly predictable. And that exposure that we've looked at for the most part is surgery. But beyond that, interested in dentistry and emergency medicine, more broadly, acute care. And we asked ourselves, is this important? Is it important for that patient not using opioids coming in to receive opioids? Does this matter? And what we know now is that it matters in, in several ways. To answer the earlier question, 70 to 90 percent of the pills we prescribe after surgery go unused. I'll challenge you all to go home tonight and go through your medicine cabinet. You have unused pills in your medicine cabinet. I know it to be true. There's at least 60 percent of this audience that will have opioids in their medicine cabinets, and you'll find them tonight. Some of them will date back to the 80s. We've seen meds back to the 70s. <clears throat> Interestingly, though, <clears throat> and important, this was this question of new chronic use. Does exposure from acute care matter? And we know now it does. For major and minor surgical conditions, we found that 6% of people not using, this administrative data, 6% of people not using opioids in the year prior continue to use and fill opioids long past what would be deemed norm normal surgical recovery. In knee and hip arthroplasty, it's 4% for hips, 8% for knees. And there's no association between the severity of the surgery, in other words, major versus minor surgery, and the likelihood of chronic use. And I think Richard laid it out perfectly. This, this is people using it for either, either pr uh, other chronic pain conditions, but also misusing it for sleep, mood, and other factors. We've seen now 10% in curative cancer surgery, and really striking new data that are unpublished from our group Receiving an opioid after third molar extraction wisdom tooth surgery is independently associated with becoming a new chronic opioid user. An adjusted odds ratio of 2.89 percent uh, of 2.89 after adjusting for medical, psychiatric comorbidities, the impaction status, demographics. So this is important. How we how we practice matters. So our group is more than a research effort, though. I will say we're doing a lot of additional work, and it's hard to give you a snapshot in five minutes. But we're we're engaging providers. Between Mike and Jen and I, we estimate we've talked to probably 10,000 providers over the last eight to ten months. Uh, we go around our state. We use a, a unique network of collaborators funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan to go around our state and talk to surgeons and actually receive real-world data in to help build the guidelines that Dr. Schlissel was kind enough to mention. Uh, we've now got 14 surgical conditions, and soon we'll have more. Um, giving providers actual numbers on how many pills to prescribe. Um, that we've spent time in Lansing informing policy. We're actually working with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, and I've been incredibly impressed by their forward thinking, once again, to say, could there be payment incentives? Could we increase the professional fee for surgeons and providers to uh, prescribe appropriately? And the answer is yes, and we'll be piloting that at the University of Michigan in the coming months. Local quality improvement efforts. Now we're, we're interested beyond just the surgical quality collaboratives from around our state. What can we do in our own house here at the university? And then how can we give a toolkit to our state to allow others and others outside of our state to do the same? We're looking at behavioral interventions. We're interested in positive affect interventions and resilience interventions as a way to decrease opioid use. Doing community outreach through things like opioid disposal drives. We just had our sixth drive in September. We collected 900 pounds of pills in four hours from, from 11 cities around our state. Um, and um, the thing that I'm actually really excited about, in addition, before I go on to my last slide, um, is this work with the arts and humanities. And I think this is what makes Michigan different. Dr. Schlissel uh, talked about the Precision Health Initiative, uh, the opioid use case, which I'll be leading. We actually was coming back from a development again. I had seen these beautiful kids from, from the School of, um, of uh, Music and Theater perform incredible incredible talent. And it was an aha moment because I had been at community high school presenting, which was a more intimidating crowd than this right now, um, and juniors and seniors. And they, um, 
They don't want to listen to old man Brummett. They don't want to hear me talk about and, and approach this from a Nancy Reagan, don't do drugs. And so I reached out to the, to the chairs of, of musical theater and voice. They enthusiastically replied. We brought in two families, uh, five people, two parents who had lost their kids to heroin overdose, a family who's a mother whose daughter's been in and out of addiction, um, and then two people that by all accounts really should be dead, living in uh, abandoned homes in, in Detroit, um, multiple overdoses, all their friends friends with whom they hung out at that time are dead or in jail. And they told their stories. And in, in that period of time, these 40 kids from School of Music have already created three songs, which I've heard. They're powerful, really powerful, targeting teens and adolescents. And we, by the spring, um, I'm going to just put the flag in the sand. By the spring, we will be touring our state with a 30 minutes of contemporary music and, and rap targeted at um, middle schoolers with a 15 minute talk back. And that's what makes Michigan different in the space and where we can actually improve. So we are, we are unique in this space and we will use the breadth of our campus. And I think that shows when precision health can go into the arts and humanities, we've really done something innovative. Um, and I, and I will leave on this precision health thought. So we are going to focus this opioid use case around acute care prescribing. I think this is a place where we can have impacts. As I said, we can drop prescribing from 60 pills or 90 pills on average to 15 pills, but then the individual matters more at that point. When we're not over prescribing to everyone, we need to look at factors like the type of surgery, maybe some genetic factors, but things that we don't measure very well, social support, and, and then mood and pain, and think about informing prescribing, thinking about risk of new dependence misuse, and we need to take information from chronic users, abusers, and opioid overdoses, and bring them back to that first conversation, that first very predictable exposure, and inform that exposure, and inform that care, so that we can improve care within acute care. Thank you. So this is our second audience response uh, question, uh, which is relevant to the uh, last two presentations. Um, and since the panel can't see it, I'll, I will read through these. Um, opioid addiction, well, it could be called addiction. Addiction um, involves activation of neural pathways via multiple receptors, depending on the opioid. Uh, B, most commonly, opioid addiction starts with <coughs> exposure to illegal opiates or street drugs, which then leads to drug-seeking behavior. C, in young adults, exposure to opiates in high school strongly positively correlates with addiction. And D, it is likely that the propensity uh, to opiate addiction involves multiple neural pathways and can differ for different individuals. And as I said, there's not necessarily a right answer. Uh, this is an opportunity to engage uh, you and our panelists. <laughs> All right. So they, these are, seem to be settling out uh, pretty strongly in one direction. And uh, uh, Dr. Fagel will uh, address you, uh, followed by Dr. Trainer. How do I? Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shelley Flagel, and I'm a behavioral neuroscientist in the Department of Psychiatry. So based on your response, I really don't have to talk for the next five minutes. I think you get the take-home message. But I'll go ahead and, and give you an overview of our work. Oops, am I pointing it? Is that? There we go. Okay. So I'll put these up here for a few seconds, and I see various expressions in the audience, and I'm sure there are certain images that caught your attention more than others, and it probably differs from that of your neighbor. So, oops, can I use the keyboard? Is it? I don't know why it's not. There we go. I'll just use that. That's fine. So there's a number of factors that may determine which cue you may be more attracted to. For me, my weakness is typically Starbucks. So I see a Starbucks sign, and no matter what time of day it is, how much coffee I've had, or how much money I've spent on coffee that day or that week, this sign usually does its job, where it draws me into the Starbucks coffee shop, I purchase my drink of choice for that day, and I consume it. But while cues in the environment can guide and regulate our normal everyday behaviors, they can also lead to maladaptive or psychopathological behaviors. So an illustration of this is imagine an addict coming across a used needle in an alleyway. They see this used needle, and just the sight of it alone will, it will elicit these intense feelings of craving and desire that will lead to drug-seeking and drug-taking behavior and potentially relapse, even in periods of abstinence. And even when the addict desires to remain abstinent, <laughs> recognizes that this is not a good, a good move to make. 
In my lab, we use an animal model to study individual differences in how one responds to cues or signals in the environment. And so what we do is we, place, we use rats and we place them into a chamber, and in this case, an illuminated lever, which for simplicity you can think of as a Starbucks sign, <laughs> is presented. And what it does is it signals that food is going to be delivered in an adjacent food cup. And so for, for this rat that we call a goal tracker, they see this Starbucks sign and they simply wait patiently for the reward to be delivered. They're not particularly attracted to the Starbucks sign. What it is is simply a predictor that reward is going to be delivered. However, on the other extreme, we have rats that we call sign trackers. So these rats, they see the sign, and they're maladaptively attracted to the sign itself. And because they're a rat, they'll see this lever or this signal, and they'll actually approach it, and they grasp it, and gnaw on it, and chew on it, as if it were the food itself. So for both of these rats, that, that lever, that sign, signals that food's going to be delivered, and they all consume the food that's delivered. And you should note that they don't have to do anything. This is a classical Pavlovian conditioning paradigm. It's not, it doesn't require an instrumental response, yet we see these very distinct phenotypes emerge. The goal trackers simply glance at the cue, wait for food to be delivered. The sign trackers are maladaptively attracted to that cue. What we also know is that now if you have this cue associated with drug delivery, either opioids or cocaine, you still get this maladaptive abnormal response in sign trackers. So sign track, for sign trackers, these drug cues become what we call these motivational magnets. So they're now extremely attracted to the cue itself that signals drug availability. We also know that if you show them this cue, this signal that's previously been associated with opioid delivery, they're going to show differences in patterns of brain activation. So sign trackers show this enhanced engagement of what we call the cortical thalamic striatal circuitry, or the reward circuitry, or motive circuit. And so compared to goal trackers, you see all these regions light up very intensely in sign trackers and absolutely nothing in goal trackers. So we're able to engage different neural circuitry in sign trackers versus goal trackers just upon exposure to the cue that was previously associated with opioid delivery. What we also know is that if you now allow sign and goal trackers to self-administer or take opioids or cocaine by themselves for a few weeks, give them a period of abstinence, and then expose them to the drug cue alone, you'll see enhanced drug-seeking behavior or enhanced propensity to relapse, but only in sign trackers. So this is supposed to illustrate that we can use animal models to study the underlying neurobiological and psychological processes that contribute to individual variation. And not only that, but we can target specific phases of addiction. And in this case, we're able to show that individuals that respond differently to cues associated with food reward do the same for drug reward. And that also maps on to enhanced propensity for addiction, and in particular for relapse. So what I've hopefully convinced you of is that there's different neural and psychological processes underlying each of these phases of the addiction cycle. Of course, once you start the cycle, it's difficult to break. But, but using animal models to get a better understanding of what those processes are at each stage is going to be critical for future therapeutic interventions. So we've already heard that in terms of initial use, adolescence may be a period where adoles adolescents may be more likely to use drugs in the first place or to try drugs, especially if, if one has a person personality trait of being a risk taker or a novelty seeker. We know that that can then lead to heavy use and dependence and ultimately relapse. And we know that there's a number of factors, of course, the neurobiological factors, but on top of that, you have genes, environment, your peers, your social group that we've heard a little bit about. All of these things interact to render one more or less susceptible to addiction. So the take-home message, as if we didn't know that addiction is complex, it's a multidimensional disease, and it's going to take a lot of effort to, to find good therapeutic interventions. And as neuroscientists, what we're trying to do is elucidate the neural and psychological processes underlying addiction at each of the phases with the hope that moving forward we can act across disciplines to find better treatment options and especially tailor those treatments to individuals. I just talked about that. And what moves it? That one, okay. So that's the point. Okay, well, we're going to go really tiny now, I'm afraid, but uh, not necessarily afraid, but instead of uh, this, we're going to go right down to a single molecule, which is this, this thing, the opioid receptor. And I should say at the start that I'm really in favor of opioids as analgesic drugs. I think they're terrific drugs, and in spite of everything that's been said, an old friend of mine from England, Henry McQuay, is also a great believer that they work in chronic pain. So that's, that's, my, that's where I stand. 
Um, so this is what, what we work on. This is the opiate receptor. It's in a membrane here within, oh, sorry, within a nerve cell. And this is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. And uh, the endogenous opioid peptides, which we release during stress and, and, and pain, they, they move into the body of the receptor here and bind to this site, which we call the orthosteric site. There's a picture of it over here. It's a nice lipophilic hole where the, recept where the drug sits. And when the, when the, sorry, the endogenous peptide sits. And when it sits over there, the receptor opens up. And when it opens up, it's able to to uh, bind intracellular proteins, which we call G proteins, and then that leads to all the, the good the, the things that have been talked about. Now, the, the problem with this, or the, I said the good and the bad about this, is that this is where the endogenous opioid bind, but also morphine is in the same place in that receptor. Oxycodone binds in the same place as that receptor. The various fentanyls, and don't remember now, the streets are being flooded with very dangerous fentanyl compounds. They bind in the same receptor in the same place. 6-acetal morphine, which is the, uh, metabolite, the active metabolite of heroin, also binds in the, same, in the same place. So everything we do, not only our endogenous system, which is, which is uh, responsible for, for our pain control and, and responses to stress, they're all acting at the same place. And not only that, as Alan uh, talked about, they all signal through a variety of, protein, of, of intracellular signaling pathways. These pathways over here, that change channels that lead to, for example, pain relief. There's uh, enzymes that phosphorylate the receptor. There's things that internalize the receptor and lead to tolerance, for example. And there's other uh, proteins over here that uh, can cause changes in gene transcription and change, change things like that. And every one of these uh, drugs that binds here, whether they're exogenous drugs or the endogenous opioid peptides, <coughs> do exactly the same thing. Then we talk about the brain, and opioid receptors are very... Uh, this is a, a, a picture from Albert Mansour's paper when he was working with Huda and Stan. This is... Opioid receptors are very well expressed throughout the brain. They're in the parts of the brain related to emotion and, and reward. They're in parts of the brain related to pain. They're in parts of the brain related to respiration. And as uh, was pointed out in Alan Blasbaum's talk, Aspirin doesn't know where to go, and neither does morphine. So morphine doesn't know where to go, and so it goes to all of these places. And so morphine, from a pharmacologist's point of view, and I'm a pharmacologist, it's the most wonderful drug because it's got all these fantastic effects you can study. Maybe not from a human <laughs> clinical point of view, but from a pharmacologist's point of view, it causes analgesia because it's acting in places like the periaqueductal gray and the spinal cord. But also, it's acting in parts of the brain to do with reward, and therefore we get addiction liability. And also, it's acting in parts of the brain to do with respiration, and therefore we depress respiration. And so I think th this is a serious issue. This, obviously, we want the analgesia. We need some of these other things in different cases. It's nice to have this tranquil euphoria feeling if your patient's obviously in pain in, in the hospital situation. It's nice for them to feel as though they're relaxed and going to get better, but most of these things we want to avoid. And so as, as basic scientists, this is what I think we can do. We can start to understand, we can keep looking at the biology of opioids. There's the endogenous opioid system, the endorphins and enkephalins and the exogenous opioid system. We need to understand more about the circuitry of pain and addiction and their interactions. In other words, how all these bits and pieces work together and can we separate them out? But as I said, I'm most interested in these receptors right down at that single molecule level and their effectors. And if we go back briefly, we've got all of these. And, and uh, Alan Bassbaum talked about this new idea of biased agonism, where you might have drugs that can activate one set of these that might be the beneficial set and not activate these that might be due to uh, res causing respiratory depression and constipation. And there are several groups around the country and several companies working on those. But there's absolutely no reason why we might indeed target intracellular targets. Why, you know, there's, there's not just the receptor here. There's all these intracellular targets that we might be able to target as pharmacologists. There are other sites on the receptor. We're, we're in particular, we're working on finding other sites on the receptor that might therefore change the receptor. So the receptor's not just being activated in that same place that it always is, but maybe there are other sites, and we've identified some other sites, that alter the way the receptor is talking to these other systems. So there's many different ways we can attack this system uh, as pharmacologists. So, uh, and that should lead us to develop safe, effective, non-addictive pain treatments. 
that could still be based on the opioids, but as we've seen, don't have to be based on the opioids, but also <coughs> lead us to develop medications for opioid use disorder, so to treat opioid abuse, and also overdose prevention and reversal. Now, I was asked to say that this is all, all very well, but you know, when we're talking about these biased agonists being discovered, this is nice, but it's going to take 10, 20 years for these to get on the market. That's a long time. We can't really afford to wait that long. So I was asked what basic scientists like me that work you know, in a little lab with a, a bench and, and, and a few test tubes, what we can actually do. And so I think we can do quite a few things. We can still study those drugs. We can, st still st we can study oxycodone. We can study the fentanyls. And we can try and advise people like Chad on the best ways, you know, the best situations of those once we've understood the pharmacology. There's been a lot of talk about biomarkers. We can identify biomarkers. Why are some people responsive to opioids? Some people aren't responsive to opioids. Why are some people addicted and some people not? They don't. One minute. OK, good. We're actually also working with groups to get information on street opioids and their toxicities. You know, there's floods, there's new, new derivatives of, for example, fentanyl and carfentanil and really toxic opioids getting on the street almost every day. So we're working with groups to do their, look at their pharmacology and toxicity. We need better antagonists. These new street drugs that are coming on are lots, much, much more potent than anything that's been out there before. And although first responders have naloxone to, to give to people to reverse that, some of these, these are just not strong enough to reverse the new ones. And there are bitter antagonists out there. And we can, we, in, in the research lab, there's dozens of better antagonists. So we need to work out ways to get those antagonists on the street quicker without going through that laborious process. And of course, oops, as several people have mentioned, I think even basic science has a role to play in education. And I think we can go forward with that. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, we have um, a half an hour uh, for discussion. The idea was to have plenty of them, and maybe more, uh, plenty of chance for you to ask what is really a broad range of experts and expertise uh, questions, and it may involve responses from one or all. So uh, does anybody uh, want to uh, start? Oh. Yes. Who will do you? Uh, my name is Richard Fernandez. Um, thank you all for your presentations. Um, because we started with pain and have maybe circled back to the science of how we've treated pain, um, I wonder if this is a good opportunity from this, this panel here to get an idea of what framework you're using for defining the pain experience um, and how that affects our our interpretation of the literature and how that drives uh, future research forward. Does that question make sense? <laughs> I think that's for you. <laughs> I think that's a great question. Wow. Yeah, uh, is my mic on? I think so. Uh, it's a great question. And I talked about the big problem with him is you cannot see it. Now, people laugh when they say that uh, there's a VAS for pain, visual analog scale, 1 to 10 or one to a hundred, from no pain at all to the worst pain ever. And someone says, oh, that's ridiculous, can't put a number on it. Well, the fact is it's actually useful as a first step. Now, the important thing I always say, if you tell me your pain is a two and you say it's a two, that doesn't mean you have the same pain. But if I could give you a drug and your pain goes from, or let's say you started at six and you started at six, I gave you a drug and yours went down to four the next day and you went up to eight and I know that I did something good for you and something screwed up for you. So it is a useful way uh, as a first step, but there are many other scales. People are looking for autonomic indices and failing. The big hope is that some imaging might be able to give you an area of the brain that says, oh, when that lights up, you have pain. I doubt that there's one single area. There's a matrix of activity. So there's different approaches, but you, you really uh, touched on what is an incredibly difficult problem is to know when something's working. And it may very well be that a particular drug is going to pull out a certain feature of the pain experience. Pain is not just the intensity of the injury. There's an emotional component and there's a cognitive component. The woman who's giving birth to a baby who wants the baby versus a woman who doesn't. Well, pretty much the same stimulus, but there may be very different pain experience. And so how do you measure that? Um, I leave that to others. But it's a big problem. Big problem. 
I mean, I'll just say I think um, the, 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 there's a want in the pain community, especially in clinical research, to come up with an objective measure of pain. However, those objective measures of pain would largely be created on a subjective report. And um, there is a lot of work in the brain imaging community, Sean Mackey and Tor Wagger, um, and even people in our group at the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center, Rick Harris and Steve Hart, have been looking at uh, some machine learning analyses of, of, of brain imaging and, and show some encouraging um, signs with respect to predicting. I, I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinterpretation of that data to like determine who, whether we can prove someone has pain or not. That's not really the, the point. Our, our group's particularly interested in that with respect to differentiating populations and understanding whose pain might be due to a more central nervous system effect versus some of the more peripheral effects that have been discussed, which are both important, but actually tailoring your care to that individual based on that signature should be important. Um, I think we have a, a ways to go, but, um, but brain imaging is, is really a, starting to um, ramp up and, and um, we are very fortunate here at the University of Michigan. We have some real expertise when it comes to uh, brain imaging. Anybody else want to comment? Please. Uh, Charlie Koopman from here at the University of Michigan. Two, two uh, uh, points I'd like to bring up for discussion. One, patient satisfaction scores that are used for monitoring physicians supposedly uh, expertise or whatever can be adversely uh, affect the prescribing pattern. Because if you fail to give what the patient wants, your score may go way down. So how are you going to manage that aspect of the prescription problem? The second is, with Blue Cross concept of paying or incentives for reducing pain pres prescri prescriptions, uh, that could all, what's the ethical basis for that? Because you're paying a physician to potentially withhold treatment that the patient may need. So how do you avoid that? Uh, I mean, that, that is a real issue, I think, ethically. Hi, Dr. Kubin. Good to see you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I'll answer both questions. One, we published a paper in JAMA earlier this year showing in a, um, looking at HCAP scores. Uh, the two pain dimension scores for, uh, and there was absolutely zero association. No, not even close to an association, no trend, nothing between the number of pills prescribed and a person's satisfaction. That doesn't mean if you underprescribe to an individual that you may have a lower satisfaction score. And in the era of if you only have a few ratings online, maybe that'll hurt your ratings. There's no question that among surgeons, this has influenced prescribing. But our data suggests, and this is not just from us, we've, had, we've seen this um, from a cesarean section population from Brian Bateman's group at the Brigham, um, no association between number of pills prescribed. What was associated, however, the more, the more you give, the more they take. Their pain doesn't change. Satisfaction doesn't change. Refill rate doesn't change. We actually published another paper showing there's no association, association between number of pills prescribed and the likelihood of refill. We didn't say that people don't call for refill. But overprescribing doesn't prevent refill. Overprescribing doesn't improve satisfaction. Satisfaction matters in a number of ways. It's important even when we take the payment incentive out of the model, which has now been removed, it still matters because you care about the next referral. I get that. However, what matters more is, are, are you nice to the patient? Are the, are the staff nice to the patient? Do we call and are we attentive? There's been studies in pain, and, and Dr. Basmal has probably seen a number of come across his desk as editor in pain, where you clearly improve pain, clearly reduce opioids use, and there's no difference in satisfaction. It's been going on for years. So that's one thing. The um, ethical concerns you have for Blue Cross Blue Shield's um, payment and structure, I hold the same concerns. And I think this is about how it's messaged. We aren't simply talking about incentivizing surgeons for paying for prescribing less. We're talking about appropriate pain management. And right now what we're doing is so grossly inappropriate across our state and across our country that that every talk I give around our state, somebody from the back of the room who's been practicing a lot longer than I have comes to the front of the room or from another country and says, when I started, I never prescribed for this case. Or when I was in another country, I never prescribed for this case. And my patients did fine. I came here and now I prescribe for this case every time. And I don't feel like my patients do better. And I think we have to have a radical conversation today, not 10 years from now, today, about improving prescribing and doing it appropriately, where I agree with Dr. Trainer, I agree with Dr. Bosbaum, that I think that the opioids are appropriate for acute pain. I think they're inappropriately 
dispensed, and I think that they're overused at, for every single surgical case. And there are randomized control trials for third molar extraction showing no improvement uh, from an opioid compared to NSAIDs and ibuprofen. So why sh I, and, and acetaminophen? So why should we prescribe opioids to those patients? So I think it's a, it's a it's an opportunity to have a radical conversation. And I think with 91 people dying every day, or now it's over 100 patients dying every day, we owe it to the community from from the other side to say on an ethical side. We, we owe it to the community to have an ethical conversation about a radical change to surgical prescribing. Other comments? Um, I, I want to follow up with that. Um, we, we've heard a lot about uh, pain, treatment of pain, and uh, other uses for opiates or other drivers of opiate use. And uh, there is also the... Um, issue of people who've been taking opiates, who then stop taking opiates, but have some sort of pain. And uh, I guess I'd like to, I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts kind of ranging the spectrum um, of first, uh, how, how can we differentiate those different potential causes of pain? The, the, and second, uh, how do we differentiate use that's really not related to pain, but related to other effects of opiates? And uh, maybe, Richard, you, uh, you have thought about this based on your study. Well, I don't have an easy answer for you, unfortunately. But what we do do is we ask our respondents why they misuse the opioids. And we have a list of about seven or ten different uh, reasons that people typically use opioids. And we find again and again that uh, getting high is the big answer. Um, and I suppose, with the help of you and the other panelists, we could uh, potentially expand that list uh, to different types of um, uh, side effects or something of that sort uh, to look in more detail at some of the reasons why um, these opioids are being misused. Do you know where did they get their opioids? The vast majority say that they get it from their friends and their family. So, so they get it from the medicine cabinet that Chad talked about. Right. Yeah, we, we asked them. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we asked them if they buy buy it. Very few actually end up buying them. Um, they're mostly getting them um, from their medicine cabinet. Sugar slide all the time. I showed, I showed the pie graph showing there's only 4.4 percent of people getting them from uh, from drug dealers. It's, it's mostly friends and family or their own prescriptions. That's right. Um, hey, please come to the microphone. Uh, Hi, I've, uh, I've been a pain patient since uh, really since I uh, broke my L5 due, a, due to a closure defect, uh, which is uh, spina bifida oblongata, in 1991, when I used to do uh, a lot of triathlons. But um, eventually I had a, a spinal fusion because the... Uh, became a chronic source of uh, inflammation. Uh, the, the vertebrae wasn't completely formed and uh, it would try and heal and it would break. It would try and heal, it would break. Um, at which point I was like, well, it's never gonna heal, so let's go to the fusion route. Uh, I'm sorry for this long story, but uh, uh, I had this first fusion done while I was in graduate school and uh, I specialized in uh, mass spectrometry and proteomics and went on to a postdoc in, in uh, x-ray crystallography and, uh, and what I found was uh, uh, having a purpose uh, was, was the of, of the utmost uh, importance in terms of me uh, getting off the the medication, the pain medication, and and, and not not that I was I was in an extreme amount of pain, uh, even during getting off the medication, but having that purpose, um, and uh, uh, towards the end of my postdoc uh, or in the middle of my uh, postdoc, I had a relapse, and uh, went through a variety of. Uh, Diagnoses as to what to do, uh, whether or not to have a second fusion. Other people say no fusion. 
uh, eventually got referred into chronic pain uh, pain management and got on the opioid trail and and then the reality is is if I if I uh, had just been prescribed a, a decent muscle relaxer uh, and decent anxiety medication I probably would have avoided uh, all the opioids altogether uh, uh, most pain doctors uh, and, and regular doctors don't even know that uh, the only really three decent muscle relaxers are uh, 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 Flexeril, uh, Xanaflex, and Baclofen. Uh, the others are, are no better than a beer. Uh, and and uh, the Flexeril and, and Xanaflex have terrible dry mouth. And if I, if I hadn't had a background in, in, uh, uh, in, in research, uh, uh, I had a terrible sore throat that uh, uh, from a parvovirus, uh, uh, I was on Xanaflex, which gave me, you know, I, I would have been suffering for forever. Uh, and, and I did the research and found out, oh, Baclofen is, doesn't have any of these side effects. Um, and and just, just to, to end, uh, uh, I just want to put a comment in. Uh, right now, I, uh, uh, I started uh, 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 I started coaching uh, swimming, and, and uh, that, that's kind of what I started out as, uh, as an athlete, uh, and, and that gave me purpose, but I was recently uh, dumped from that job because uh, I had an upper back problem and a shoulder problem, and I'm no longer able to, to uh, coach because I can't swim. Uh, and uh, so I'm still looking for a new purpose, and uh, I recently started uh, music lessons. Uh, learning to play the guitar, and and, and, I, and I, I don't hear I didn't hear enough today about uh, alternate uh, uh, really pushing uh, low cost methods to to deal with pain. Whether it's learning the guitar, I, I spent a ton of money on massage therapy that isn't covered by uh, any uh, uh, insurance, uh, and yet uh, massage therapy and and when I go to my music lesson, I'm I'm pain free. Uh, when I'm when I'm you know listening to you guys and I'm digging in through the research, uh, I'm I'm pain free. And so I, the uh, pain is 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 as much or more about distraction than it is about anything. Um, the the cost of these new drugs that you that we 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 wish for, uh, Lyrica. You look at the structure of Lyrica, and it's it's such a simple molecule. It looks like I could synthesize it in my in my back room, for God's sakes. And yet, it's not covered. Uh, gabapentin is a useless piece of garbage drug that I still that I'm taking at a low dose, but I really don't think it's doing nothing. Uh, monoclonal antibodies. The cost of monoclonal antibodies is is enormous, uh, and, and yet they they they. I've made them. They, they, you. It's a, it's a merger of a, of a cancer cell and a, and a, uh, uh, immune cell, and they just pee out antibodies relatively pure, and, and yet the cost of, of monoclonal antibodies is just, uh, you know, at a minimum. Uh, I, yeah, I think these are the issue of non-pharmacologic uh, approaches. I think is very important. But I'll just, John, you had a comment. I just wondered if you'd ever tried acupuncture because you know that's I, a sort I, of that's I, an opioid without an opioid. I have tried it, tried it, and and uh, that's really no effect. There's, there's actually some very beautiful your 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 emphasis on distraction attention is absolutely right on. I happen to play jazz piano and. One of the reasons is I can't think anything else, science or whatever. Uh, there's, yeah, there's some beautiful studies, imaging studies, where people have looked at, you take a, a controlled painful stimulus, say heat, and you get a certain activity pattern in the brain, very characteristic, and then you, and you, the individual has uh, earphones on listening to music, but you ask them to concentrate on the stimulus, and you get this. Now you ask them to concentrate on the music, and you find the activity generated by the heat is reduced. Uh, dentists have known that for years. That's why they'll sometimes stick music uh, things in your ears. Um, um, the the, the Lamaze, where a woman studies, you know, before giving birth, it's all about distraction, attention, anxiety relief. So if that works, go for it. 
There's every reason to believe. But in some people, that's not enough. And so until we come up with something better, I completely agree with you with respect to cost. And that's a different issue that we'll let Victor solve. <laughs> uh, Gail, and then we have another uh, question back there. I'm uh, quite motivated by this lengthy last comment. Um, this program was tremendous. I really enjoy the scientific aspects, as you'd expect. I also have a background in public health and in communicating about health. And I think that our message is way too complicated. Um, it's hard to put together all the different approaches that are being taken, all the respect for individual variation, without having a starting position, a default, for what should be the strategies most of the time. I'll give you a motivating point for me. Uh, 15 days ago, I was in California for, uh, to see my two-day-old granddaughter. And uh, I went with my son to pick up the prescriptions that my daughter-in-law had been given by her obstetrician. So there was ibuprofen, and there was acetaminophen, and then there was Norco, 30 pills of Norco, which she didn't need. And when I told this story to the group, somebody said, well, 30 pills, that's nothing. Our experience was that a young mother was given 90 pills. So it's no surprise that there are a lot of pills hanging around in people's homes for teenagers to experiment with. And this should be unacceptable. It's not enough to say, we're having an education program for physicians, Chad. I mean, there ought to be messages, clearer messages, about what the defaults are. And in fact, Dan Claw and you wrote an editorial that I read in preparation for this session, which says exactly that, that most of the, the um, debilitating aspects associated with pain are from other symptoms that are coexisting, depression or fatigue or other things for which there are all kinds of non-therapeutic, non-pharmacologic um, therapeutic approaches that you've just been talking about. And they will vary across different people also. Most of them are quite inexpensive. And I, I think it behooves us to try to come up with a more a directed approach to what society should be doing. These, this is a national emergency. It's not just a scientific uh, question for 20 years down the path, as you said. And I think uh, we owe it to the society to have a much more directed message. I read Victor, the gigantic, this thick book, from the uh, IOM, NAM, and it was well done. It's very thorough, but boy, it's hard to measure any, to take away a message other than some legalese for the FDA. So uh, we are not meeting the needs of the nation, in my opinion, with, uh, by restricting ourselves to what we know best. We have to reach beyond that and try to meet the population where we can make a bigger difference. Comments? I agree. Um, and I will say, as a chronic pain physician, it's very intentional that we didn't start in the chronic pain space or talk about chronic opioid users because we felt like the mission of Michigan Open in that first phase, separate from Precision Health, is very clear, very concise. This number of pills for this surgery, watch out for these types of patients as you come through. And we are working on mechanisms for safe disposal. That, that actually people can do in their own home. That's, that's where we're going, right? And, and so I think our narrative is, when we go and talk to surgeons, because we do, um, our narrative is very clear and resonates because it is, I, we had a neurosurgeon here at the University of Michigan walk up to me and say, I don't want to be rude, but it's so simple. And I said, perfect, right? And that's perfect. And then I clearly one of the smartest people I know but the reality is, is that's right where we need to be. And as we focus on acute care, and I can say this, I, I agree with you that we need clean and clear narratives, but it, as we think about the complexity of the problem, what we need is we don't want a single group trying to address the entirety of the problem. And if we at Michigan choose to jump right into the chronic pain space, we're, I think, years behind some of our bigger groups and others in other places, when it comes to opioids. In the chronic pain space in particular, we have tremendous expertise. And I just felt like this was a place where we could have immediate 
an incredible impact both in our state and nationally. We're seeing it right now. I mean, we're a year old and we're already seeing changes in the prescribing locally and at a state level. Um, but I, I think that's where our group has been helped by a focus from Mike Inglesby saying it's got to be clean, it's got to be clear, and we really do laser in like that. But then that doesn't address chronic pain and it doesn't address medication assisted <coughs> treatment and abuse. Because those are different narratives and they merit different pieces. They merit a different approach. Victor? Yeah, so first of all, I totally agree that uh, it's been a terrific, terrific panel discussion and a great talk, Alan. <clears throat> I totally echo what um, uh, Gil said. This issue is a lot more complex than any one of us can solve. Chad, I think you're doing a great job, but where's the rest of the medical profession? You know, where is, in fact, this, the country level, nation level profession to say, this is how we're going to be doing it from the future. So my feeling is we have a lot of fragmented uh, and segmented efforts, but we need to bring them all together. So if you look at this issue, it ranges from prescription, we've talked at length about this, to um, medical treatment, medical assisted treatment, right? And there's certainly not enough treatment facilities, no incentive for doctors to put people in treatment facility. There's a big stigma, and people in practice don't want to deal with these, and that's why they give them a prescription. There is, in fact, the overdose issue, but there's also the issue of education for our providers. You know, so in Massachusetts now, you can't graduate from medical school, nursing school, without having to pass a course. That's actually from the governor, right? And then there's the issue of law enforcement and just criminal system where more people are put into incarceration and not addressing the bigger issue of how to treat these chronic disease. So, you know, we had a federal judge who says, I see more people with mental health and drug abuse than the average doctor does, because they kept coming through my, my court. And there's, you know, there are now these uh, drug courts, which are beginning to at least take these patients and then put them in the right direction. We have a big issue. And the U.S. President's Commission has over 50 recommendations. My question is, who's going to do it together, right? So, Chad, you're doing a great job for Michigan. But what actually, at the end of the day, when I begin to put all these together between different states, different prescription patterns, et cetera, we need a system-level approach, a coordinated approach to really make a difference. And as you said, one segment can't quite do it. So, Gil, I told, I'm on, totally on the same page as you, I think we really need some kind of a national response to this. Uh, who did, were you gonna? I, mean, uh, I will say we have been freely sharing our information with other states, North Carolina, Delaware, Texas, California, sending SAS code, sending our, our, our approaches to creating toolkits. Um, Jerome Adams was actually a medical school classmate. He and I have had early conversations about what a national model looks like. And so um, we, uh, when we talk to other people in the space, we don't do so competitively. We do so in, in, a, in a collaborative way, um, telling people we hope that they uh, write the bigger paper if that's what's important to them. We really just want to do something that's going to impact the community. Um, and beyond our state, we just happen to have a unique state to address this, and that's where we start. Could I just ask how, how much you think that over-prescribing is contributing to the, the move to heroin and, and the things on the street, or is it a separate issue? No, it's not. Um, I, I, don't, I think that the over-prescribing is definitely associated with the move to heroin. I mean, right now, three quarters of the people who go to heroin um, start with illicit prescription, right? So, and, and it may not be their prescription. It may, it, it, as, as Richard said, these friends and family, um, but, but they, they find it. Now, I think it's gonna change, right? So I, I think the challenge in heroin is there's been an influx into our communities. And I was over at St. Joe's talking this morning, and um, I was saying that you know, I think that this is an, that, that we will in two or three years have a different conversation when it comes to heroin, and it'll probably be with our, uh, our poorest communities because um, heroin as a first start drug will increase just because of the sheer abundance of heroin and heroin laced with fentanyl. Um, but right now, today, um, unlike maybe going back to the 70s, um, the, the heroin starts with um, not just unused pills, but illicit prescriptions. 
Licit. 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 Legal. 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 Well, I, yeah, I can give you the answer to this. I think the statistics are clear. 60% of the illicit drug heroin stems from originally from the, uh, from the uh, prescription <laughs> side. And the main reason that people go to heroin, at least this population, because it's cheaper and easier to get, <laughs> right? Versus having to go back for a prescription. So it's a gateway to illicit uh, drug use, heroin, and others. Just throw something out because I, I, I just thought I, I want to follow up just for a brief point. I know I want to get a couple more questions. The, the gentleman who asked about uh, uh, interpreting pain, how do we measure it? And I just had this thought, I don't know why I never thought of it before. It, everyone agrees that there's much more opiate prescribing in this country than in anywhere else, say in Europe or Canada. Uh, but the question might be asked as well, so they're prescribing fewer opiates, and how are their patients doing? Which is another way of asking, how are they measuring pain? And I don't know what outcome studies there are, because you can argue, well, you know, we do a better job here dealing with pain. Well, probably that's not the answer. Uh, and then, the, so the question is, what are they using instead of the opiate to achieve what may be at least as good and maybe even better pain relief in these chronic pain patients? And I don't know that anybody's actually looking at that. Uh, and maybe that would be not a reasonable thing to examine. Um, Martin, so we have a lot of comments on this question, and I want to get to Eva, and then I'll take your question. Uh, go ahead. I can respond to that partially. So at least in England, uh, physicians frequently ask what the patient's pain goals are, <laughs> not assuming that zero is the preferred mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you start with that assumption, then you end up with a very different prescribing practice and a very different a priori set of expectations by the patient. Mm -hmm. So my question is very directed. Um, the American Academy of Neurology, not only with migraine, but for neuropathy, has said there's no role for opioids. But a, um, a very nice study was just done here at the University of Michigan by Dr. Brian Callahan, where he looked at all neurologists and primary care providers and found that for neuropathic pain, which is very common, uh, if, if the first-line drug failed, whether that be gabapentin, Lyrica, or uh, tricyclic antidepressant, the second drug in over 65% of the providers was an opioid. Hmm. So, you know, so my question is primarily to you, Chad, in a way, is, is there any thought of a parallel education program for physicians who are not surgeons, but who are really inundated with the chronic pain patient? Um, here at Michigan, you know, within our own institution or in the state? Um, yeah, there is a, a want to do that. Actually, Mike Inglesby is director of medical education, has worked with, now working with Paul Hilliard, who is an anesthesiologist, pain physician, and Goodars Golmerzai to create an educational module that's going to initially be directed at the medical students, but available. And I think there's other groups around campus. Um, Dr. schlissel has got some other groups around campus working on um, pain education and, and, and these uh, massive online courses, I think, offer opportunity. Um, there are innovative processes. Uh, University of Washington does a, a, a sort of lunch type um, thing, a webcast, where they actually talk about particular cases. and uh, Primary care physicians present their cases, and in doing so, um, everyone learns. But the idea is you have to contribute to the community. You're going to eventually, and, and that's a way to, to educate. Um, I, I think uh, your, your example of, from Brian's work uh, is, is consistent with what we see in number. The, the, the guidelines are there. Uh, implementing them is hard, and getting people to change practice is incredibly challenging. Now, to the people who aren't actually seeing patients, I will tell you that conversation is incredibly hard. And I empathize with the provider who goes against the guidelines um, because it is a very challenging situation when you're in the clinic with not just the patient, but their son or daughter or their mom or dad. And now they're looking at you like you're the most horrible person in the world because you won't prescribe opioids. And, and so while I, I learned through my pain training how to handle that situation and, and hopefully have them not bang you know, my satisfaction score, I don't have to worry too much, but they, they do care. Um, uh, I think that there is, a, there is a way to do that, but I get it. And primary care physicians are really challenged. They 40 patients in a day. How do you have that difficult conversation? We haven't really created a structure for primary care providers to have the time to have the right conversation. But our, our, our narrative is important for primary care. After three months, surgeons stop prescribing, 
it becomes a primary care person's responsibility. So the 100 million surgeries a year in the US, six to 10% of people becoming new chronic users, there's six to 10 million new, you know, new users every year from surgical care alone. And so this is a primary care narrative as well. So let's have two uh, final questions or comments. Uh, Ada Jaycox, NAM member, and I chaired the uh, pain guidelines panels 35 years ago. Alan, you were involved in those. Uh, I, I wasn't even born then, were you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would comment, I would like to make available the information that the uh, National Academy of Medicine has recently published, or will publish, the pre-publication thing is out now, um, that combined clinicians and healthcare professionals with drug enforcement agency people to deal with this issue of managing pain and also managing the opioid epidemic that we have. It's one of the best things I've seen, and I think it's good because uh, both groups work together. One of the two, two of the major groups that we had to contend with um, when we started this, one with the surgeons, our first guideline was on post-operative pain management, and the American College of Surgeons uh, boycotted uh, the work. We went to Canada to get a surgeon. Uh, after that, um, we had uh, Richard Burney uh, from here on some, on some of our panels, and we had no difficulty getting surgeons. The second group was DEA, and they uh, repeatedly refused to uh, acknowledge that that there was anything except an opioid epidemic problem. Um, we had a, a lot of difficulty with them providing data for us because we wanted to pull out uh, how much of this is due to uh, illicit use of drugs and how much is prescribing and then patients become addicted. And they wouldn't disaggregate their data for us. They would simply provide the slides that said, here's how many people are uh, overdosing each year on legal and illegal drugs. Uh, when we finally got the data ourselves and disaggregated them, 3% were from legitimate opioid drugs. The rest were street drugs. Now, I th I'm sure that's changed now, because I know it's changed. Yeah. I don't know if it's changed as much as this publication says it has, but I know it's changed. But I would suggest that these kinds of forums need to have both clinicians and people from the drug enforcement. Uh, community, because if people uh, keep having separate conversations, uh, the, the uh, problem will never be solved. And uh, Dr. Roman, I wanted to comment on the work that you and your residents are doing. I think it's one of the first things after 35 years that I've seen that quickly uh, identifies what needs to be done in the community to make these changes. And I commend you for your work. Thank you. Uh, very important comments. Uh, one last uh, question or comment. There are two kind of old saws that I brought into here. And mm -hmm. one of them, you know, you come across it in the textbooks, and I teach my students about opioids, and is that um, opioids aren't useful for neuropathic pain. But we, we dealt with that one. So another one is if a patient takes an opioid for pain, they're not going to get addicted to it. So where are we on that nowadays? Are there any evidence that really support it or disprove it? I, let me let me address that because it's a puzzle to me, and it's like I, I live. I, I've been around a long time. Uh, I grew up uh, when Twycross in Britain published a very famous study. I'm sure John is aware. Uh, a huge number of, of individuals, and he and his was the, the the paper always cited that he found only four percent of patients who were treated for chronic pain with opiates ever developed became dependent. And he said it all, and, and that 4% were patients who had a uh, history of abusing or misusing different drugs, alcohol, whatever. Of course, and Kathy Foley at uh, Sloan Kettner used to always cite that as the, 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 the standard uh, 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 knowledge. That's clearly changed, and I don't know the new data. And that's the question. And where does it come from? What changed from Twycross to the present day, where clearly nobody would say, oh, it's only 4%. All the athletes who were saying, I was take, given drugs because during the football, I, I, I ruined myself, and they became dependent. 
Uh, Twycross would have said that'll never happen. So I honestly don't know, and there's some epidemiology data that, that somebody needs to really figure out what happened. What was the change? Was Twycross dead wrong, or is something, something happened? Yes, please, Huda. Something I have not heard all day is not all opiates an equally addicting thing. And I think we have made much more addicting drugs. I feel that that is an important factor hmm. that has not been discussed. Good point, yeah. One other note is that there was never really any data from the basic science literature to support that notion either. I agree. Hmm. I agree. It's only that it goes back to individual differences. Not everybody gets addicted in the first place, so we don't know that number very well. But, but all opioids have the potential to be addicted to. Of course, to. but not as quickly. Yeah. yeah, they have a lot of differences. John, will bias line games be better? Uh, that's an open question. I, I very much doubt it. it it's, it's a missing part of every slide you see about bias line use. Yeah, they don't. They, they talk about respiratory depression, they talk about constipation, and there isn't even an addiction question mark. It just feels like it's, it's left off. I, I but, no, no, no. In the, in the McGlick <laughs> paper, just to take their side for a moment, <laughs> they looked at in, in condition place preference and said that their biased agonists, what they had, the animals did, showed much less preference than for. Uh, uh, sort of an equianalgesic uh, uh, dose of opiate. We need confirmation, we need new drugs, but clearly that's a big, big but issue. But they're all degrees, they're not you know, black Absolutely. and white. It's Anything not black and white, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I'd like to make just a couple of closing comments. Uh, the first is, this clearly is a huge issue nationally, locally, and a complicated issue. I do like uh, Gil's approach about having a simple message. Uh, but I have the feeling that we're just kind of getting going. We could continue this panel discussion uh, for hours. And I think that reflects um, the interest, the commitment, and the passion about this topic. So this, I'm sure, won't here or anywhere be uh, the last discussion. I look forward to more. I'd also like to just give a an incredible uh, series of thanks. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, the National Academy of Medicine and Victor for giving us this opportunity to host what I think has been a fascinating afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank Alan for coming in and being our keynote speaker and our panelists. Uh, we're all fantastic. And I do want to uh, underscore and thank again, uh, really, Huda, uh, Gil, and Martin, who uh, helped formulate this uh, program and uh, so I thank you all, and thank all of you for your thoughts uh, for attending. Uh, there is a reception uh, now outside, and I think uh, some of, uh, hopefully some of you will be able to uh, be there to have further conversation if, uh, if you're interested. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to everyone.